Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, class of 2026. Woo! <laughs> Some of you already know me, but for those who don't, my name is Ashley Polly. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the Director of Undergraduate Admissions here at Caltech. I'm unbelievably excited to join you all today and see you live and in person after being the or orange signatory on your admit letters. I've heard those orange notes are meaningful to you all, and they are for us also. We discuss every individualized note in committee, and some take a very long time because we want them to be so meaningful. So I'm hopeful those, hopeful those were meaningful for you as well. Let me begin by welcoming you to the traditional lands of the Tongva people, the original indigenous people of this area who are still active members of our greater Los Angeles community. It's great to, all, to have you all here for Discover Caltech Discotech 2022. A program like Discotech takes a lot of work to pull off and I wanna take a moment to introduce you to the admission staff who took your phone calls, responded to your emails, compiled your documents, read your files and helped coordinate your visits. Team, please stand and take a bow. <laughs> I also want to point out two very special colleagues, Carla and Nick, who coordinated all of Discotech. Thank you both for your amazing coordination and leadership. <laughs> Discover Caltech, Discotech 2022. Our staff member, Sophia, came up with the name, and trust me, it has nothing to do with disco balls. Instead, we see this program as an opportunity to dive into the creativity of Caltech. We hope that over the next few days, you experience a sense of wonder, innovation, journey, collaboration, and breakthroughs. Ask the hard questions, listen to the answers, explore things that are not as obvious, and promise me that at one point in this crazy busy schedule, you'll take a moment away from the crowds to sit outside, take, take some deep breaths, and take measure of that gut feeling. That feeling matters, so please do not ignore it. Since we love numbers here, and we know that you do too, let me offer you a couple quick data points. Today we have 220, 224 admitted students with 230 family members in attendance, visiting us from 35 US states and six foreign countries. At this point, 94 have, you've, have already committed to enrolling this fall with a goal of 235 new first years. I would say that I wanna see that number jump to 100 by the end of this speech, but I don't wanna pressure you. But if you feel like it, feel free. But I also don't wanna pressure you, May 1st. The most common first names of the people here in attendance are Jacob and Sean. There's three of each. <laughs> There are four students named Lauren, and there's one name to rule them all, Sophia, with a whopping six students in attendance. 
even more fun, we have a Sophia Stills on staff, and in the audience as a prospective student is Sophia Stiles. In fact, Sophia Stills read the application of and admitted Sophia Stiles. Are you doppelgangers? Has anyone seen you both in the same room at the same time? Literally, no idea. <laughs> The shortest distance traveled for an admitted student was one student from Polytechnic School, which is quite literally across the street from Caltech. The furthest distance traveled, there are students joining us from six countries today, including Greece, Singapore, United Kingdom, South Korea, Ghana, and Poland. One student who is from Singapore traveled 8,791 nautical miles to join us at Discotech, so we should all commit to be more better. <laughs> so switching gears just a little bit, there are four things I know to be true. Sophia Stills and Sophia Stiles could still be doppelgangers. Star Trek is better than Star Wars because hashtag real science. <laughs> Marvel is better than DC because hashtag it's just a fact. And Admissions does not make mistakes. For many of you, there is one thing I can promise. At some point, you will doubt yourself. Maybe it's in a class, maybe it's while doing research with a faculty member who's at the cutting edge of their field. Maybe it's late at night in your room while working on some homework. For some of you, it may have been the moment you opened your admit letter and thought to yourself, they must have made a mistake. There is no way that someone like me could ever succeed at Caltech. To get into Caltech this year, your application was reviewed a whopping six times. Six. At least five different sets of people reviewed your materials, including a faculty member who most likely works in the field in which you want to study. My confidence in your ability to be successful at Caltech is through the roof. Hard does not mean unworthy. Hard does not mean you were the mistake. I want to share some of the comments that your teachers, counselors, research mentors, what they had to say about you. They are all anonymized, so you won't know who said what. But I can promise you that each and every admitted student in the class of 2026 had people around them say some of the following things. From a research mentor, her strong mathematical foundation allows her to follow complex mathematical derivatives, which I otherwise teach in graduate level classes. In fact, I would compare her to junior and senior undergraduate students in our university's program, where I have instructed more than 600 undergraduates, all while being, at the time, only 16. This is just a snapshot of how incredible student E is. He's doing so much more, but sadly I've already gone way over the recommended length. I will say that when I reviewed my notes to begin writing this letter, I began to cry. Student E is so strong and so resilient. He will make your students' lives better. He will make your campus better. He is inspirational. One might expect someone so accomplished to be an intimidating or demanding presence. Student A is one of the most unassuming, down-to-earth students I have ever taught. He has many friends, is quick to laugh, and always in a pleasant mood. In class, he is always engaged, respectful, and helpful. I am sure that wherever student A matriculates, he will be a positive influence on those who are fortunate enough to work with him. I will miss the inspiration that he has provided me as a veteran teacher. Student L is the rare sort of student I will doubtlessly remember for the rest of my life. Formidably intelligent, talented, prolific, thoughtful, and generous, student L seems to have more hours in the day, greater mental stamina, and deeper wells of empathy than the rest of us. I am certain she will accomplish extraordinary things in her life. She is quite simply an exceptional human being. If you are at this point suspecting hyperbole or wondering if I am in fact describing a character from a Hallmark movie, I understand. The truth is that Student D is frankly an individual who needs to be met to be believed. Her future contributions to the world will be significant and numerous. I can honestly say I have never met a student more deserving of every opportunity the world can offer her. In my 25 years of teaching, I can honestly say that I've never had a student as intelligent, motivated, self-sufficient, or resourceful as student F. He is a one in a seven billion type of student. His eagerness to learn and to be successful in what has granted him so much success and is what I know will make student F become one of, if not the most successful students I will ever teach in my career. Student F is part of three marginalized groups and yet he has broken down every single barrier that has institutionally been placed in front of him. Personally, I leave you all with this assurance. When that moment of doubt hits you, I implore you to come to admissions. We are here to remind you who you are. Exceptional, creative, brilliant, curious, fun, fearless. Sometimes really out there and quirky in all the right ways. 
but definitely and 100% a teker who is worthy of this place. When it gets hard, congratulations, it's meant to be. You have arrived. You can't change the world walking the easy path. That's not how great scientific discoveries happen, and that is definitely not how we made it to Mars. But I can assure you that if you choose Caltech, you will work on science that has the ability to revolutionize the world. Believe in yourself because I can promise you with everything in my being, everyone in this room and everyone at Caltech believes in you. Thank you. Now, to introduce our keynote speaker, I invite up the Assistant Vice President of Enrollment and my boss, Jared Whitney. Well, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Francis Arnold, who is the Linus Pauling Professor of Chemical Engineering, Bioengineering, and Biochemistry, and Director of the Rosen Bioengineering Center at the California Institute of Technology. She became the first American woman to receive the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2018 for pioneering the directed evolution methods used to make enzymes for applications across medicine, consumer products, agriculture, fuels, and chemicals. She was appointed co-chair of the Presidential Council of Advisors for Science and Technology by President Biden in 2021. In fact, I believe she's missing a meeting at two o'clock to be with us, Caltech comes first, so thank you very much. Dr. Arnold received the Bauer Award in Science in 2019, the Millennium Technology Prize in 2016, the Charles Stark uh, Draper Prize in 2011, and the 2011 National Medal of Technology and Innovation. She is elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the U.S. National Academies of, uh, of Science, Medicine, and Engineering. She was appointed to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences by Pope Francis in 2019. Arnold also received her BS in Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering from Princeton University and her PhD in Chemical Engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. Now before I bring her up on stage, I should note that it's appropriate to acknowledge that yesterday was the Women's National Championship basketball uh, season final game and tonight the men's uh, team goes. And if you know anything about basketball, you always know that after a big game like that, the team members usually sign the championship basketball. It's a ritual within basketball circles. In that same vein, I have a special Nobel laureate basketball. I call it my championship ball. And if you give me some encouragement to our, our guest speaker tonight, I would like her to sign it for me at this time. This is so Caltech. <laughs> This is great. Let's see. Here we go. I want one of these. All right. Now you get, to, you get to hold it up. I get to hold it up. <laughs> Very good. Oh, welcome to science and engineering heaven. If you like science and engineering, you will be very happy here. Also, if you like a little sunshine, it's kind of nice. And all of your accomplishments make me feel like a loser, let me tell you, because you, you guys can do anything. You get to my age and it gets a little bit more limited, but you can do anything. And I get to entertain you for the next 15, 20 minutes or so by telling you what makes me happy about being here, because I get to work with the coolest molecules on the planet. And uh, if you'll bring up mine. Anybody know what these are? These are enzymes, these remarkable proteins that are responsible for all the chemistry of the biological world. They catalyze reactions that even Caltech chemists can't do as much as they'd like to. Nature figured out how to make these things, and they're all encoded in the DNA. So you heard, I have a degree in mechanical and aerospace engineering right at the end of the Vietnam War when they weren't hiring any aerospace engineers. So I got a new job as a mechanical engineer in the solar energy business. And then Reagan comes along and cars got this big again and nobody wanted solar energy. So then I went and got a degree in chemical engineering. I've tried a lot of different things. Um, I got a degree in chemical engineering at Berkeley, crazy place at the beginning of the DNA revolution. 
when we were just beginning to learn how to cut and paste DNA for the first time. We are still in the middle of a DNA revolution. But back then, I said, oh my goodness, these molecules are so amazing. They catalyze all this chemistry that would really change the world if humans learned how to do it. And so I want to build new versions of enzymes. I want to engineer their sequences to confer whole new properties that would allow us to use biology to live sustainably on this planet. Problem was, nobody had a clue how to do that. They're really, really complicated. Isn't that amazing? We can design supersonic jets. We can design spacecraft. But we can't design an enzyme. These are the products of four billion years of evolution. Now, back when I was a student, it was really hard to make changes in the sequence of DNA. It took weeks and weeks. But if you fast forward to today, the tools are remarkable. And for those of you who don't get to play with DNA, I'm really sorry for you, because it's so much fun. You can read any DNA you want, right? We've gone through the human genome sequence. You can, it's basically free. You can write any DNA you want, right? You can type out a sequence and email it off to your favorite supplier, and you get the physical DNA back in the mail. It's amazing. No, there was nothing like that when I was a student. You can edit DNA, right? The Nobel Prize for CRISPR gene editing to my friends Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. Go girls, right? <laughs> amazing stuff. So you can read, write, edit DNA, but you can't compose it. And that's what I mean by design. This is the work of four billion years of evolution, and it's like a Beethoven symphony that's created these incredible molecules and all scales of living systems. And, it, and it, no, none of us knows how to compose like that. So that's the problem I took on, and it's still a problem. So what do you do when you can't, when you can't compose? So a good engineer looks for someone who's already solved the problem. And in my case, it wasn't a someone. It was the amazing algorithm of design that biological world has come up with. It's called evolution. And it's just a simple turn the crank process of mutation and natural selection that gave rise to all the diversity and the incredible functionality of the biological world. So I said, OK, let's just use evolution. Ah, easily said, difficult to do. But it's not even a new idea. How do I get a Nobel Prize for something that's not even a new idea? Because we've been using evolution to create new biological things for thousands of years without even knowing what DNA is, right? We've been breeding corn and carrier pigeons and lab rats and racehorses. We have been making things that aren't even natural. That poodle is not a natural <laughs> biological object. It's not even fit. If it got out in my neighborhood, it would be eaten. We have a lot of coyotes here. <laughs> so we've been doing things to biology for human purposes by artificial selection, choosing who goes on uh, to have the next generation. Um, and in the natural world, it's kind of limited, right? So if you look at biological evolution in the farmyard or in you know, you got monkeys, go with monkeys, and worms go with worms, but you're not going to cross the two and get anything beautiful or useful out of that. And you can go out, I hope none of you do this, but if you go out and smoke some cigarettes, you can dial in a few random mutations in your DNA. But you don't have a whole lot of control over this process of breeding at the molecular level. But now, everything has changed. <laughs> Right? You can make any DNA you want. So in the test tube, and I don't make, this is my lab mascot. You might see it in some places. It is not a real thing. I do not make Wolfords in the laboratory. <laughs> this is to let you kind of get the feeling for what you can do in the test tube, because test tubes aren't as interesting as Wolfords. But if you can take DNA from any species and any number of parents and with any level of random mutations, you can start thinking about, wow, how could I breed new enzymes uh, to make something that humans would want? And, and I want you just to think about the possibilities here. I mean, out here, so are any biologists in the audience? Oh, no. Yeah, I'll, I'll insult you first. <laughs> biologists are just 
looking at the tiniest fractions of the possible biologies. You know, everything that's been relevant to humans or relevant to natural selection over billions of years fits in the tiniest fraction of this universe of possible organisms and possible molecules. And out here in that universe is the, is the cure to cancer. It's the solution to the energy crisis. It might even be the cure to death and taxes. <laughs> you just have to find it. So how do, you, how do you explore this space? That's really the problem. And if you think about some of the numbers, and I know you guys love numbers, a typical protein, 300 amino acids long, 20 letters in the alphabet, you have more than a universe by many orders of magnitude worth of possible sequences you could explore. Right? So how do, you, how do you do this on a time scale of, say, a PhD thesis or a summer research project? Right? How do you make something useful? And that was the problem I had to solve uh, back when I decided I was going to use evolution. And I'll just point out, if you haven't read this fabulous short story by Jorge Luis Borges, please do. It's, it's only a few pages long. It's about a library of all possible books that you could make by randomly assorting the letters of the English alphabet. And they're also randomly assorted in the library. And so the, the, the librarians throw themselves off the balconies in despair of ever finding even a single meaningful sentence, much less a whole book of literature, because there's so many possibilities. And most of them are total gibberish. And the same is true of proteins. So this was my challenge. How do you search through this library of all the possible proteins and find the cure to death and taxes, or at least you know, a better laundry detergent? And that's what we had to do. And to make a long story short, if you want more in depth about this, you can go to my Nobel lecture or a number of other lectures that are on the internet. But basically, I figured out that we are the products of evolution. Therefore, we have evolved through a simple process. And if you do the numbers right, you realize it has to be pretty much one mutation at a time. So it's an optimization problem. This is real engineering. Optimization problem on a fitness landscape whose structure we don't really know, but it has to be smooth in some of its dimensions. And if you can just make mutations, say, one at a time and search through the few thousand ways you can do that, you can start just gradually improving the properties of an enzyme without knowing anything about design. It's like making Beethoven's symphony one step at a time. And, it, and the bottom line is, if that didn't work, we wouldn't be here to talk about it. So we can learn some things just by thinking about it. And it turned out to be really useful just by making random mutations and breeding the next generation, choosing who lives and who dies. Oh, well, yeah, or at least, you know, who doesn't get flushed down the drain. You could make enzymes that really are in your laundry detergents, that make pharmaceuticals, that make biofuels for jet planes. Um, and it uh, is really very useful. But what I love to do is not just improve things. I actually wanted to create chemistry that you cannot find in the biological world. Why? Because my colleagues in chemistry, they really got pissed off when I won the Nobel Prize, because I'm an engineer. This is the way that, and they said, oh, you know, that biology, it's cute, but you can't do what I can do. And if you look at all the chemistry of the human world, it, it's mostly human chemistry. It's not biological chemistry. All this stuff in this room is made by human chemistry. So I decided, hey, how would evolution, could evolution be used to import what we've learned from human chemistry and encode it in DNA so that bacteria could replace all those chemists? They didn't like that either. <laughs> but, and get outside of what biology has explored. So I'll just give you a, a quick answer to why that's just the same kind of problem. Because enzymes are like you guys. You know, they work really hard for not much credit. And if they decided, so selected for that, you are selected for working hard or you wouldn't be here. But you can do something other than science if you decide that science is not for you. Enzymes can do all sorts of other things, right? Wash dishes, you know, be a basketball player. You're probably better at science. Um, enzymes are selected for one job, but they have 
what we call promiscuous capabilities that can be drawn out by this evolutionary process and become the fuel for, say, adaptation to a whole new environment. So you throw some new antibiotic out into the world or some new pesticide. There's all these organisms working 24-7 to figure out how to get around it. They're doing exactly this. Somebody has a little bit of activity on it just by chance, and that gets pushed through multiple mutations. You know, that's how coronavirus gets around. And so we can make enzymes if we can recognize what these promiscuous properties might be. So here's just one little example. If you look at the periodic chart, I mean, so my chemistry friends are correct. The chemistry of the known biological world is, lim is big but limited. And there's whole swaths of the periodic chart where you can't find carbon X bonds in the biological world. You know, you, you find carbon bound to all the halogens, and you found, you know, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur. But, you know, there's whole black places where humans have gone, but biology hasn't. And, and one great example is silicon organosilicon compounds, silicon carbon bonds. Do you know there's no silicon carbon bonds in the biological world? Yet there's 50 products in this room that have silicon carbon bonds, the earbuds in your ears, the hair gel on your hair, the caulks and sealants and paints. It's, it's a huge industry that uses platinum uh, for catalysis. And platinum is not something that we want to rely on because it really does terrible damage to the planet even just to get the platinum. So we said, oh, gosh, let's find some enzyme that has a little bit of activity for making carbon-silicon bonds. And here's where just a little bit of knowledge of chemistry. I never comes in, comes helpful, right? I, I try not to become too expert at anything because then you start thinking like everybody else. I always say, do what all the other monkeys are doing. But I, you know, I picked up a little chemistry along the way and, and had good reason to ask whether a cytochrome C, we found this cytochrome C, which is a little heme, iron heme containing protein that comes from a hot salty pool in Iceland, and no, I didn't go to a hot salty pool in Iceland, we pulled it out of a database, has no cat catalytic function, it's not even an enzyme, it's an electron transfer protein. It's so stable because it comes from this, this hot salty pool that you can even boil it, you can even give it to a chemist and they won't even know it's a protein. Yeah. So it's just a magic silicon carbon bond forming powder. And What's remarkable is that if you feed it a silane, so this is dimethylphenylsilane, and a precursor that makes a reactive carbene intermediate, that protein will catalyze the formation of that silicon carbon bond 40 times with almost perfect enantioselectivity, which is just as good as the best human chemist was ever able to do, or at least publish, with this kind of chemistry. So there's just sitting out there in Iceland, a protein that says, I, I'll do it. Just that protein never had a chance to show it could do it because natural selection gave it no advantage whatsoever. But we asked it. We had good reason, chemical reason, to think it could do that. And so it, it, this was quite remarkable. So I'm talking about this at a conference, and in the front row are sitting these chemists. Oh, Francis, don't you know that a that a cytochrome C doesn't have an active site. What does that mean? It means that if you look at that iron, it's sitting ligated to a number of other things in the protein. And you know, if the molecules, the substrates have to come in and out and the chemical reaction has to take place, it's hard to see how that happens. So if you look at the crystal structure and you take your computer ball and roll it all over that, you come up with a big fat zero for the volume of the active site. Yeah, you know what? Nature doesn't care about your calculations. And this is what we have to understand, right? You, you're calculating what you think describes the natural world. Nature doesn't watch your calculations, and it certainly doesn't conform to your calculations, especially when it comes to biology, because this molecule's flopping all over the place, and it catalyzes this reaction. And not only that, you can turn the crank of evolution, making mutations and artificial selection and drive up the activity, walking up that hill again. 
and get it published in a snooty journal. So we got it published in a snooty journal that made us happy. And when, uh, you know, I heard Star Trek, when the news went around the world, no, no one, one read the paper because it was a really, really boring chemistry paper. Chemistry papers are super boring. It had 130 pages of supplementary information on all the qualities of the molecules that we made using this enzyme that nobody ever made before because they didn't give a hoot about them. But when we published it, there was a, a report from science where they said, oh my goodness, silicon-based life. You remember the Horta episode? You know, Spock and... It's looking for life inside the rocks. Well, they got this all backwards. We're not trying to put life in rocks. We're trying to put rocks in life. You know, you just can't uh, deal with a journalist. But the fun thing, the fun thing is that this went, this news went around the world. And when the paper was published, popular science, they didn't read the paper. They read that article and says, oh, I don't think so. I, I'm sure that 90% of you know why silicon-based life is chemically very unlikely, and popular science probably has a chemist or two on the staff, so they said no. But Astrobiology magazine really liked the story, so they said, oh, this gives us hope for silicon-based life. My paper said nothing about silicon-based life. <laughs> Evolution News comes in, and says, oh, this must be evolution news. That's the in, uh, creative, you know, the creationist literature. And so they're saying, that must be intelligent design. I said, yes, yes, I am the intelligent designer. <laughs> evolution is definitely the intelligent designer. But the funniest part is, I don't know, how many of you are on Twitter? It's not a thing. It's only in my generation. Well, let me tell you, if you go into science, you got to get on Twitter because the funniest reviews of your papers, there's a big uh, Twitter community in science, and we review each other's papers. And if you want really funny reviews of your papers, go on Twitter because now I can make my own breast implants, and let's see, uh, my computer gets... Anyway, there were, there were some really good ones that went around, and we had a lot of fun with how people saw, saw the research. And it got me an invitation, the best invitation I ever got, <laughs> to go down the street. OK. <laughs> See, it, it led to the greatest accolade of my life. I got to go and waste a perfectly good morning <laughs> at, at Warner Brothers Studios for this show about Caltech students who go from being endearing graduate students to being annoying professors lobbying for Nobel Prizes, right? <laughs> That's the natural progression of things. So after 12 seasons, no more Big Bang Theory. Um, but I'll have you know, I was the only woman ever invited to play herself on that show. <laughs> Go figure. Times have changed. Times have changed. But it, was, it really was a lot of fun. I also got invited to a little party um, in 2018, <laughs> this was taken at 3.30 in the afternoon at this small house uh, on the bay. And let me tell you, um, if you ever get invited, you should go. It, <laughs> it's a great party. And I met all sorts of people in fancy outfits there, and my kids got to go. But one of the people I met was Donna Strickland, the first woman in 55 years to win the Nobel Prize in physics, our Canadian neighbor there. And so we're grinning from ear to ear, playing with our chocolate Nobel coins. These are chocolates. And you know why? Because Nobel laureates are notoriously forgetful. Most of them are ancient. The ones that aren't ancient are just so excited they can't think straight. And so they leave them lying around. And they've lost a few of the gold medals that way. So they said, you can't have your medal until you get on the airplane and go home. So we, <laughs> we had to uh, have fun with that. Anyway, that's just a little you know, kind of foray over the various things I've done in my life that, um, that have led to a really remarkable journey. I feel so lucky to have been here at Caltech because I could explore things, crazy. People thought I was nuts and that using evolution, you know, what kind of science is that? And I said, well, I'm 
I'm an engineer, you know, I'll laugh all the way to the bank. And, <laughs> and I got away with it. But, you know, the, bi the biological world is such a great place for chemistry and biology and physics and engineering. And uh, we have a lot to learn. Now, I just want to end with the newest job I've taken on. So I've had many jobs over my life, from taxi driver to, uh, to the one I took in January for President Biden. Uh, I'm, I'm co-chair of the President's Council of Advisors in Science and Technology, and that takes me now to Washington on a regular basis. And I want to show you something kind of nerdy from when we were announced at the, back in January 2021. Um, the, you see the binary code over there uh, on your right that reads hope over fear. It reads unity over division science over fiction, and truth over lies. And that's what science is about. And that's what we can do, what you can do with your brains and your capabilities. You can make these things happen. So please come to Caltech and do that. Thank you. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I thought we'd spend just a few moments of her time. Thank you very much for spending a few extra minutes with us. Just to ask a few of the questions that were posted already, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, she does have to leave at 2.15, and we have to keep on schedule for the next segment of the program, and Ashley will lead you to that after we're done speaking here. So the, one of the questions that got asked is, what's the best thing about Caltech, Caltech and one thing you might actually change about Caltech? Oh, gosh. Best thing about Caltech is its small size. Uh, it's so easy to cross disciplines here. I don't know if you got it from my talk, but my research covers everything from computation. We do a lot of machine learning, which I didn't talk about because it's just too short a, a time, to basic molecular biology, chemistry. And that would never have happened in a place where science is more siloed. And the bigger you get, the, more, the greater the tendency for departments to kind of coalesce and students don't wander in between. Here, you can wander anywhere you want. And uh, you can work for any professor on campus. You can join a laboratory and try the things that you are curious about. And that, that curiosity is, even the old folks have that curiosity. So that, that, that's what's so great about it. And I've always enjoyed that. Maybe one thing you would change about Caltech. Uh, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I can't even think of anything I would change. Maybe it's small size, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, something you mentioned a, a moment ago, and I think it's important that everybody know this, can undergraduates actually meet with you and maybe even do research with you in your lab? I've had 200 surf students over my career in my laboratory. So yes, surf students often come in, people who do research during the year. Um, I have enjoyed working with freshmen uh, the whole career. And you just have to love what you do, and, and we try not to beat it out of you. This is a comment. You are so inspirational. I just wanted to read that out loud. <laughs> Another question. How do you overcome fear of failure when tackling a challenging problem that everyone says is impossible to, to, to overcome? I never even considered uh, failure. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm, uh, I, I've been accused of being oblivious. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I've tried a lot of things that didn't work, right? And then you just... Go and try something else. I didn't even start this job until I was 30, and I did a lot of kind of failure things, right? I, I joined the nuclear industry, solar industry, biofuels. I did all things that didn't work out, but it's not failure, right? It's just something, some knowledge to put in your pocket that you can use later. Uh, so I don't even look at failure as there, especially in education, there is no failure. 
You're just filling your brain with things that you can use at some point in what will be a long life, and a life where science will change so much. I think this is a good question to maybe even end on. What were you doing when you got that little call to go to that little party you were just mentioning? Oh. <laughs> I was snoring in a hotel room in Dallas. I had gone to give a talk um, and uh, got w woken up at 2 in the morning by that call. No, it was 4 in the morning in Dallas, and it was 2 in the morning back in California. So, of course, I wanted to, to share it with my kids, and I call, and of course, no one answers the phone. <laughs> no kid is going to answer the phone when his mother's calling at 2 in the morning, and so I had to wait four hours, and then my son goes, what do you want, Mom? <laughs> <laughs> and I won't say what he said afterwards, because he's... <laughs> Anyway, he was pretty excited. <laughs> then he had to go over to another house and wake up my other son. <laughs> well, you're off the hook. Thank you Good. again, Dr. Arnold. And Well, that was great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Francis Arnold. Um, really quick, so I know we've met uh, most of you today um, since I was helping out with check-in, but just to introduce myself, my name is Carla Riaga. I'm um, the Senior Assistant Director in the Undergraduate Admissions Office, but I'm also one of the coordinators, and I have my colleague here, Nick, as well. You want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Nicholas Lee or Nick Lee. I'm one of the admissions counselors and the co-coordinator for Disco Tech. Yay, and we're just here to give um, you all a little, um, a couple of housekeeping items, reminders for the rest of the program. So first of all, guidebook. During check-in, um, we asked you if you had already downloaded guidebook. We hope that you all did already. Um, guidebook basically is going to give you a detailed schedule, the description of each session that is scheduled um, for the rest of the program, and also the locations on campus as well as at the Hilton. Now, if you have not downloaded guidebook, um, it's really easy, you just go on your app store, you download um, the app, and then when you actually go into the app, you are going to be asked for a passcode. That passcode is discotecker22, and then you're able to download the guidebook um, program. Now, we do ask you um, to, to stick to the buildings that are on guidebook for each of the sessions. We ask you that you do not go into any other buildings that are not listed on guidebook because you are not allowed to go into any of those buildings. Um, another great and fun thing, too, is a scavenger hunt. So if you haven't looked through guidebook, please look through um, the scavenger hunt on there. Uh, you are to search for items listed on the guidebook, look for them around campus while you're here, while you're um, you know, talking to students, if you're going to take a tour, if you're going to one of the sessions, take a photo of your findings and then submit your photo on the Caltech Community Network Discotech discussion under scavenger hunt. And my colleague Jan Lacoste has already started that discussion. There will be fabulous prices um, for the students who complete the scavenger hunt, so definitely take a look at that. And I also want to give a shout out to my colleague Melissa. Melissa? Um, Melissa, thank you so much because Melissa worked very, very hard on putting together our, our guidebook. And I mean, it looks amazing. It has everything that you will need for um, the entirety of the program. Now, another reminder, um, we are collecting, collecting questions for each session through Slido, so the links are on the guidebook as well for each session. We do encourage you to please submit your questions through there because, um, as you see, we do have a large crowd, so some of the sessions, it'll be very difficult to take, um, it, to take live questions. Now... Um, I want to remind you also on Guidebook, you are able to sign up for financial aid appointments. So once you go onto Guidebook, 
on the right left hand side I'm sorry um, of the menu you will be able to go down to Celtic resources find the financial aid tab and financial aid will be um, scheduling one on one appointments from April 11th through April 14th so definitely go on there if you have any questions about financial aid and one last thing for me is um, a reminder about the next session so we have um, sessions from 2 30 to 3 15 um, we have the internship and career exploration session we have a thriving at caltech panel we have a women in stem panel and we also have an opportunity for you all to take camp a campus tour nick yeah and so a few more housekeepings for today's schedule and all this information i'm going to go over is also in guidebook especially times i'm going to mention um, so meals for the rest of the day dinner will be in the south fields with our cds Feel free to take a seat first before you head out to grab you know, a plate, just because our CDS needs a few more minutes to set up. And we'll also be releasing tables at a time so there's not too long wait times for your meal tonight. Um, shuttles for today will be shuttling you all back from here on campus back to the Hilton Hotel. Um, and there's gonna be kind of two groups for that. So parents, you're all gonna have a parent reception, family reception. Um, after dinner on the South Fields, students, you'll be heading to your own program called Caltech Unplugged, and you'll get to meet some of the houses tonight, little spoiler. Um, parents will be leaving at 8 p.m. on South Wilson Avenue. The shuttles will be there to pick you up and take you to the Hilton. Students, you'll be going from South Holliston Moore Circle and get picked up at 9 p.m. taken back to the Hilton. We'll have volunteers and our staff here to make sure everyone gets back to the Hilton, no one gets left behind. And in general, if you do have assistance or need assistance or have questions, our admission staff is here to help answer any of those, as well as any students or ambassadors in orange or black discotheque shirts. Um, if you also have questions, just feel free to seek us out. The tents out here, that there is like the check-in out here. That's where campus tours will be going from, and there will also be someone there as well if you need help, okay? Um, I also wanna mention at the Caltech store, if you bring the program that is in your packets, you will get a discount, and that is cool, so do that. <laughs> and lastly, I'm gonna bring up my colleague Tessa to kinda talk about a fun tradition we're, we have. Hello everyone. Um, so at dinner tonight, um, we will be celebrating some of the people who have already committed to Caltech. So um, we expect that there'll be a couple people who might commit during this program. Maybe hearing Francis Arnold was the thing that made you think, I wanna be here, I wanna work at the same place that she works. That's what I think every morning when I wake up. Um, and I will be walking around with a cowbell. It is really loud and you get to ring the bell if you've committed. We will probably be starting off dinner by bringing a few people up on stage who have already committed so you can show us what it looks like. And then throughout the next few meals, um, if you have committed, seek me out. I will be walking around finding people who've committed um, because you'll get to ring the bell and you also get a nice little ribbon to put on your badge so everybody knows that you're committed. So if you've already committed to Caltech and you're here, or if you're a QuestBridge student maybe, um, and you've already committed, um, I will be handing out ribbons uh, this afternoon or this evening at dinner, um, and I'll fi be finding a couple people to ring the bell. Well, thank you all very much, and um, you're all dismissed, so you can go on to guidebook and look at what session you are planning to go next. Thank you all. Woo! I like that little, woo. Is that your mask or no? No, that's um, Nick.
Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the Thriving at Caltech panel with Dean of Undergrad, Kristen, and our representative from the Student Wellness Center, Grace. Um, I'm gonna introduce them a little bit and remind you all that for this session we have Slido, so if you go into Guidebook, during the time you can post questions on there and even upvote them. At the end we'll have Q&A that I'll help facilitate. Um, but this panel is for you all to learn about the different resources here on campus, in particular what it means to thrive at, at the Institute. And these two folks know how to support folks in that journey. So I'll hand it over to them. Clap. <laughs> nice. Uh, what am I doing? <laughs> Sorry. Nope. Which one am I using? All right. Hi, everybody. Well, I guess if you wanted our names, um, <laughs> they were up there. But my name's Kristen Wyman. I am the Associate Dean uh, for Undergraduate Students. Um, thank you. Uh, so just wanted to talk a little bit first about the Dean's Office and uh, who we are and what we do. So um, we've got a couple of administrative folks, Beth Laranaga and Sarah Laredo, who uh, are the first people that you would see if you walked into our office. They're pretty much always there answering questions, helping people out, and scheduling things for us. Um, I am the Associate Dean. I work primarily with our first and second year students, which is why I'm here talking to all of you today. Uh, we also have a second Associate Dean who is right now our Interim Dean, Leslie Nye. She works primarily with our juniors and seniors. Um, and typically we do also have a Faculty Dean we are in between faculty deans right now uh, since our former faculty dean has now become the VP, Kevin Gilmartin. So um, Leslie is serving as our interim dean right now. Uh, so these are the primary things that our office works with. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about academic concerns actually in the next slide, but that's probably the thing that we spend the most time doing is talking with students about concerns and a number of different aspects there. Uh, we also put on the peer tutoring program out of our office, and I'll talk more about that in a minute as well. Um, the other thing that we spend a good deal of time on is personal well-being, and that's because it's so broad. Uh, so when I say that, I mean you know any kind of issues or concerns, whether it's personal issues, social uh, or you know emotional kind of things, could be um, illness or an injury or an accident, any of those things that kind of take a student away from the classroom or you know kind of disrupts their um, either their learning or their uh, living environment or anything like that, and then we would work with you to figure out what's going on and how we can address those concerns and get you back either into the classroom or into your housing or lab or whatever it is uh, as smoothly and as quickly as possible. Uh, we do manage a significant emergency fund. We provide both grants and um, loans through that for students who are financially needy. So um, commonly this um, takes the shape of, say, a airline flight home, uh, so paying the airfare for uh, maybe a death in the family or something like that, an emergency of some kind. Um, it also could be um, dental care is another big one that tends to slip past insurance and end up costing folks a lot of money. This is the age when you have to get your wisdom teeth out, for instance, and if you can't pay it and you can't manage to make things work, um, that's where we come in. So really any time um, that finances seem too tight and it's something that financial aid doesn't cover, which is pretty small here because financial aid covers a lot. But when you're in that in-between and something comes up and you just don't know what to do, um, give us a call, come come on over, ask us, you know, hey, is this something that this, this fund could be used for? And we're happy to talk about it and, and make arrangements as needed. Uh, and then the, the fun thing at the bottom here, which is always positive and a great experience, and that's new student orientation. I won't get into too much detail here, but uh, we do provide a week-long orientation program in the fall, right before classes begin, uh, sort of a, a welcome week program. Uh, so students will move in. We have usually one day of programming that includes parents, and then we send parents away, and the rest of the week is for students to get 
acclimated to, you know, living in a residence hall, meeting friends, meeting roommates, uh, figuring out where and how to eat <laughs> and do laundry and all those things, but then also getting to know um, academically a little bit more about your schedule and different support systems and meeting with your advisor and things like that. So uh, as far as academic support, as I mentioned, uh, one of the primary things that comes out of our office for this is a, they're called Dean's Tutors. And those are peer tutors, they're students who uh, are upperclassmen who have taken a class in the past and have said, you know, I volunteered to, to tutor this, I was really good at it, I did well in it. They have to have a certain grade, obviously, in the class to be eligible. Um, and then they track their own hours and they get paid by us to tutor students who sign up. So it's really simple, it's meant to be um, fairly informal. Students will usually just kind of look online, we have a list, um, it is password protected so y'all can't look at it, but students can. Um, and uh, they just kind of look up maybe who lives in their house, who is a tutor for Physics 1C. And they'll find out who that is and they'll call them up or they'll just walk down the hall and knock on the door and say, hey, I'm looking for a tutor, can you help me out? Um, so meant to be just a, a great resource, an easy resource, um, and something that you know students don't have to pay for on their own. And like I said, it's totally paid for out of our office. So just a simple way to get a little bit of extra help. And since they're students, they know exactly what our rules are around collaboration and things like that. So students don't get into trouble with the honor code and and, and those kinds of issues. So it's great. Um, we also work with first year advisors. So first. Students will all have a faculty member advisor in their first year. That's before, at the end of their first year, they'll declare their option and they'll have an option advisor who will work with them. But in the first year, they have a first year advisor who specifically works on advising them in the core. You know, what are those basic requirements? How do you make sure that you get them all done? If you're struggling with one area in particular, maybe um, physics and math are great, but chemistry is kind of tripping you up. What can you do? And so those kinds of issues, they'll, they'll advise you on those. They meet, uh, you'll meet your first year advisor in the first week during orientation actually. Um, and that usually takes the form of a group meeting. So we put all incoming students into groups of about eight students. Those eight students are all assigned to an, either an orientation group or advising group. We use the terms kind of interchangeably, but uh, one advisor for those eight students, and typically they all live near each other, so that you know those might be your roommates or your suite mates, but they also might be living a little bit down the hall or something. Um, but just a kind of a chance to have this little group that shares an advisor. They also share uh, what we call an FCC, which is short for Frosh Camp Counselor, it's basically your orientation leader who goes through the week um, and again through all really all the first term to help support new students and get them acclimated to campus. Um, we also work with academic performance and progress. So the deans receive midterm grade reports for all students, but we focus on these in particular for our first year students, of course, um, to just help make sure people are doing all right. Um, typically, they'll get a, what's called a midterm deficiency if a student is receiving a C minus or lower. And that's basically just a, a kind of a reality check, right? Hey, uh, something might be going on here. Doesn't mean you're gonna fail the class, but if you didn't change anything, you might, and you're in danger of that. So we wanna make sure to get people connected to different resources. That could be tutors, um, making sure that they're going to office hours and TA hours and things like that. And then the whole host of wellness resources that Grace is gonna talk about in a minute. So um, lots of different options there, but it's just really kind of a, a gut check there and a chance for several different folks, usually um, myself or their RA also often will check in around midterms and just kind of have those conversations about what can you do differently, what might you not be taking advantage of if you received one of these midterm deficiencies. They don't stay on a student's record, they don't follow them around, it's really just meant to be helpful so people know kind of some kind of baseline of where they are halfway through the term. Uh, the deans, we also work around um, underloads and overloads with students. So typically our, our students will take between 36 and 48 uh, units per term. 
a full-time class is nine units, so there's a lot of math involved, <laughs> as you would expect at Caltech. But um, the gist of it is they're usually taking four or five main classes, and anything less than, than 36 units would be an underload. That would be approved sometimes for different medical reasons, uh, and so we work with students one-on-one -on -one if that's the case to make sure they're not falling behind, they're not gonna you know, get off track with their requirements, or if they are, kind of how, what can they do about it and how can we make up for it later. Um, and same thing with an overload, that's if a student has a really compelling reason to take more than the limit. Um, mostly those are approved if they are for things like adding an, you know, a sport, athletics, um, a, a performing and visual arts course, or research, so things that maybe students are doing that are healthy and they're outside of the, you know, strictly the classroom, but still helping to kind of enrich their experience here and it maybe just didn't quite fit into their schedule. Um, but in particular for the first two terms, we limit freshmen actually on their, on their number of units a little bit more strictly, and, but they're also on pass-fail. Everyone is on pass-fail those first two terms. So that's all just kind of meant to ease that adjustment into Caltech, since we know this is a very rigorous place, um, and we wanna make sure that everyone is, is succeeding in those, in those first two terms and in that adjustment, because it can be a big one. And finally, we do work with students around uh, leaves of absence. That could take many forms, um, but often it's for medical reasons and could be, again, an injury or an illness that just takes them away for too long and makes it too hard to catch up that term. Uh, could be psychological, um, could be for, again, maybe illness of a family member or something like that, that that just takes them away and they need to take time off. So we work with students to take the leave, but then also to kind of assess readiness and return from the leave. And again, kind of help make sure that people are on track and that they can find um, the right classes when they come back to enroll in and to make sure that everything kind of transitions smoothly. Um, it can be a little disruptive with all the ins and outs, but uh, hope, try to make that as smooth of a process as possible. And I will stop there for now. All right, good afternoon everyone. So my name is Grace Ho and I'm the occupational therapist at Student Wellness Services. If you're not familiar with occupational therapy in this role, I will be sure to explain that. Um, but today I'm representing our entire Student Wellness Services, which includes our health, counseling, and OT services. Um, so I'll be giving a brief overview on each of the services and what you can really expect to get out of each of them. Is it down? Yes. Okay. So um, first thing here, if we look at this lovely Google map, um, our orange star is where we are right now in Beckman Auditorium. So our student wellness services can be found at 1239 Arden Road. And this is just south of us where that red heart is. It is technically considered off campus and students will say, hey, that's really far away. But we're really, you know, if you just cross the street on California, we're right there on the corner. Um, our office hours are Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 p.m., and we're closed on Institute holidays. If you want to follow us at any of our social media, oh, pretty good. Hmm. I'm not touching it. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm gonna put this one down. It's going on its own, okay. <laughs> All right, it's, all right, curse for today. This is my first time presenting in this auditorium, and that's the first time it's happened to me. Usually technology likes me. Um, but anyway, um, so all of our services are located at our center right here on 1239 Arden Road. Follow us on social media because that's where we post events about um, you know, our workshops, our outreach and groups, um, our flu vaccine clinic, uh, so on and so forth. So it's really one of the best ways to get little bits of information. And then on Instagram, about once a week, uh, we invite students or any of our followers to just ask questions, general questions about our services and we try to answer it there. But otherwise, our website is wellness.caltech.edu, and there is a lot of information on there, but it's the most comprehensive and most up-to-date place that you can get information on what's going on with our services. All right, I'm gonna to try to carefully advance the next slide. Okay. All right, first things up, we have uh, health services. So this is your primary care. This is your first stop for all injuries and illness, right? So if you sprain your ankle, if you're feeling under the weather, um, if you have allergies, if you need a referral to dermatology for acne, like so on and so forth, this is your first place to go. 
Um, you'll see that my last bullet here is repeated across every slide. And what I would really like you to take away from this is if you are on campus and you come for a visit with any of our services, whether you come and you see a nurse practitioner, you see one of our counselors, you come and you work with me, all of that is free. Um, a really quick way of thinking of it is if it's on campus and you're making that visit, you're making that appointment, that is free. Um, insurance kicks in if, let's say, you need antibiotics and you need to go off campus for a prescription. So that's where insurance would kick in. If you need some extra imaging, if you need to run certain labs and you go off campus for that, then that's where there might be a cost involved. But if you're just coming to see us, you want to get a consult, um, you know, aches and pains, you just want to work on something and you're on campus at our little center, all of that is free. So really come and see us and come see us earlier than you think you need. Um, so in addition to health services, you know, thinking of it as your doctor, your primary care, um, we can also help make referrals to different specialists in the area, um, and we can get you connected um, for those things. Um, we also have, uh, this is where you go for pre preventative care, your wellness checkups, um, your yearly physicals, uh, sexual health, so on and so forth. So pretty straightforward. All right, um, next up is our counseling services. And since I'm not a counselor, I asked our director to give me like a one word sentence for what counseling means. So for those who are familiar with counseling, this is going to be our traditional psychotherapy. It's our counseling. And he says that counseling is this really great place to talk confidentially with a professional who can really talk to you about how to take care of your emotional well-being. So this is not only your relationship with yourself, but also your relationships with others. So if this is something you would like to be connected with, then you you can go ahead and contact our counseling offices. Um, for counseling, we also have an after hours crisis line. It's basically available 24 seven. So if you are having a difficult day, you can always, during office hours, you can always walk in, you can always call for a same day appointment. And if it's after hours, you will still be calling that same counseling number. You'll be prompted to press two and just stay on the line. And then they'll connect you with our um, after hours protocol service and after that connect you to a therapist. So really being able to get that support um, no matter when that, that is. And that's pretty much 24 seven, including all holidays. Um, other things that we have in terms of counseling services, um, we can also help make referrals to a community therapist if that's something you would like. And we do have an in-house consulting psychiatrist. And again, um, all students are eligible regardless of your insurance because if you are just coming into our center, meeting with one of our therapists, that is free. All right. Ooh, thanks, Susan. Um, our next one here, this is occupational therapy, so that's me. Um, if you are not familiar with occupational therapy, you can really think about occupations as how you occupy your time. So what I mean is this is your habits, your routines, your leisure time, your academic time, your social time, your sleep, and your self-care. And unlike traditional counseling, uh, we really have an emphasis on concrete strategies. So if you come and you meet with me, we'll really talk about what's meaningful to you, what are your goals, um, what do you want to change. And if we have a follow-up appointment, then we really want to see you, you know, make an effort at those changes, come back and troubleshoot and see what works for you. So the most popular topics that students will bring up end up being time management, productivity, organization and planning, uh, motivation, procrastination, and sleep. Uh, you're not limited to just those topics, um, but it's anything that's important to you in making a healthy habit change. Um, students will also often go to both counseling and occupational therapy, so they're not the same thing, but you can really get a more holistic form of support um, through these services. All right, so on to the next one. Okay, so outside of these individual services, um, you'll also find us basically at some events throughout the year. Um, we do groups and workshops pretty much every single week, and what we have up here is just a small listing of the workshops that we normally do. We have a secular meditation mob that is open to um, users of basically all levels, right? If you are brand new to meditation, you can come. Um, if you are an experienced you know, meditation meditator, I should think about that. But um, basically, just come and join us every single Tuesday for Meditation Mob. Um, Dr. Coleman has been leading it since 2014. Um, we also run a variety of workshops, so procrastination, getting better sleep, how to organize your time, how to tackle your term. Um, we even do financial literacy for those grad students, learning to budget for the first time on your own. 
And in addition to that, um, our health services, we do run a free flu vaccine clinic every single fall. And so that is just something we bring onto our campus and students can just make an appointment and get their flu vaccine. It's pretty simple, um, in and out. And of course, you'll also probably find me at different events just by request. So we work with a lot of student groups and we bring programming to them. So sometimes it's teaching RAs how to help their own undergrad students. Yeah. Um, and then maybe just one last piece is, we also have a variety of recorded workshops, right? So if, let's say you're not sure if you know, OT or counseling is right for me, you can always come to the workshop as a way to get to know a clinician. Um, so that's just a really good way to get to know our personalities and our styles. So if you learn a lot from our sleep workshop, um, maybe you can say, hey, I learned a lot, but I need to customize this just a little bit more. We also recorded all of our workshops during the pandemic. So those are really good resources to just learn at your own pace. All right. Okay, so I'm also here representing a, just a little bit about our accessibility services. So at Caltech, this is called the Caltech Accessibility Services for Students um, with the acronym CAS. And you'll want to go to the CAS website and there um, you'll have all of the information for how to register or just learn more about some common accommodations. Um, a really good person um, that you can really reach out to is Mark Lazar. He's our accessibility specialist and he'll be the one to you know, talk with you or talk with your student about um, anything related to accessibility. He has drop-in hours on Wednesdays and it's just really easy to get a hold of him. So if we just go over some of the common um, academic accommodations, this could look like extra time on your work, um, having access to a space that is quiet and not distracting. Um, this could also mean you know, the use of like enlarged text or anything else and you'll be able to work um, with Mark Lazar and with the professors on those specific things. Um, there's also some common residential accommodations, so maybe this is having a room that doesn't have carpet or making sure that that bed is not lofted. And again, um, any information there is just on cas.caltech.edu. Right. Okay, and I think this is our, our last slide before we move on to questions, but I'll just provide a little bit of information about our care team, and this is the mission statement here. Uh, the, the function of the care team, and it includes folks from uh, the dean's office, from um, the Office of Residential Education, uh, security, campus security, student wellness, obviously, um, but it's sort of this broad team, there are eight of us, um, who work to ensure student success, to make sure that no one slips through the cracks. So uh, we get referrals from a number of different sources, could be from a professor, from a staff member, from a parent, from another student even, uh, who report in through, through an online form. Um, and you can always go to caltechcares.com, uh, I think, or Cal something about, <laughs> well, it's through the wellness website, it's through the dean's office website. Anyway, Caltech cares something, <laughs> caltech.edu slash care, I don't know. Um, but anyway, there's, so there's more information there about it as well as the reporting form. But um, the idea is just to sort of gather information from different constituencies and any time that people are concerned about a student. So um, whether we would reach out directly or not really depends on the circumstances and it might be like, a, oh, okay, well the student's missing class in one of these classes, um, but so far that's not a huge concern, right? But if three different professors are telling us that someone is missing class um, for the last two weeks and maybe a parent has told us they're concerned or someone else, you know, certainly that's a very different level of severity. So we meet as a team every week and we talk about different reports that we've received and kind of what the best way is to address them and sometimes it's through the residential life staff, sometimes it's through the dean, sometimes it's directly through wellness services. So the idea is that we have this sort of multi-pronged approach that we can reach out in different ways, but we're also a team who can collaborate and again, sort of assess the situation and make those determinations. So here is kind of a safety net to make sure that everyone uh, is doing okay academically, but also mentally and all of those things. And so um, just wanted to Put that up to let you know, obviously our offices are both uh, represented on that team and we do work together quite a bit outside of the care team as well, just kind of a lot of referrals back and forth and making sure that students are getting connected to different resources. I think that is it. But we will 
Transition to questions. Okay, so I have Slido up, so feel free to continue to submit questions and all that. So, um, first question for you two. Um, I think a big, kind of very general question, well, not general, but a bigger question. So as parents, are there signs we should be aware of that might indicate our student is encountering problems? And I don't know if you want to speak from your experiences, what you've seen in those different ways. Concerns that indicate a student is having problems? Was that the? Yes. Okay. I mean, I would say it really can take a lot of different forms, and it really boils down to, is your student acting like your student? You know, if you are noticing changes in behavior, um, and those could be, um, you know, things like they don't seem to be leaving their room, and they used to be really social. They don't seem to be bathing as much. Um, you know, so they don't seem to be sleeping enough. Some of these are just getting busy in college, right? But some of them, if it feels like a warning sign to you, it, it probably is one. And you're certainly welcome to reach out anytime, either through the care team or directly to the dean's office, and say, I'm worried about my student. Um, you know, they don't seem to be themselves. They don't seem to be OK. And you know, we'll ask you more questions, obviously. But mostly, I think it comes down to you know your student. You know who they are. You know what their habits are. And yes, a little bit, that's going to adjust. But essentially, they're the same person. So if they really seem um, dramatically different in, in one way or the other, um, do let us know. And we're happy to, to follow up with them and to, to see what we can learn and, and whether they're OK. Um, I agree with everything that Kristen said, and just in working with students, it's really more like um, if you notice a decrease in their love for science or what they do, so their hobbies, um, and just maybe not even getting joy out of attending the class and the learning and maybe whatever would have brought them to Caltech, I would say that's usually what I see a lot. And then another one is just if they've been increasingly isolated from their friends, um, and social support is just a really big one, not only in their success and happiness, but just like if, we're t if we want to help someone be productive, we need them to take breaks and go hang out with their friends. Cool, okay, next question. Um, can you all speak about the different kinds of accommodations students have received on campus for either class or um, any services they've received, specifically from like CAS or from your offices to support them? Oh, sorry about that. Um, let me repeat. So can you all speak about the um, kinds of accommodations that students have gotten in the past for either classes or for living on campus um, and, any, and the, just the different services they've gotten um, while being a techer here. Uh, let's see. So I guess um, Mark Lazar isn't here to speak for himself, but I would say definitely go to the cast.caltech edu website, um, please feel free to email him. Um, what I do know is that it's a collaborative service, you know, with the student, right? Really figuring out what does the student need to do well. So even though, you know, increased um, test taking time or extensions tend to be really common, we really want to individualize it, right? We can't just give everyone, you know, more time or like extensions because that might not address their needs, you know, as appropriately or as well. Um, I know sometimes um, it goes beyond just CAS, and you might be able to even work with our dining services to make sure that any dietary restrictions and preferences, like, that can be accommodated. Um, yeah, I guess not too much for me to say on that. Yeah, the only thing I would add is um, there are sometimes need for temporary accommodations. A common reason for that is a concussion for instance, or maybe a severe illness, something like mono, um, where a student can't perform up to their normal level, um, so they need accommodations, but they would be temporary just until the student is recovered from whatever that is, and that also is something that uh, Mark works on through CAS. Cool, okay, next question. This one goes to kind of the procedures that have been happening on campus around COVID, just what, how has, how have those, um, procedures and check-ins been go working on campus with COVID and testing and um, what are like requirements for students and such. Ooh, okay. So I'll start off with this. Um, all of that website is on the together.caltech.edu website. And so for the um, 
during the course of the pandemic and with school opening up, we have had students uh, a requirement to submit basically two samples per week um, within 48 hours of each other. And that's just to make sure that they are caught. And so let's say um, when that surveillance pool is run, if something gets flagged positive, then what would happen is the student would then be um, asked to uh, show at the health center for a uh, confirmation test, right, to see if um, that test is positive or not, just to double check. And if the student is positive, then we have a lot of procedures around moving into isolation housing, doing contact tracing, um, making sure that we do something comprehensive, uh, making sure that they can still receive, you know, food and support and continue to attend their classes in the best way possible while this is happening. Um, yeah, yeah. There is a dashboard, uh, again, you can find it through together.caltech.edu, uh, reporting cases, but we haven't had um, a huge outbreak here on campus or a spike or anything like that because I think the things have been very well managed through the, the testing protocols. Um, students are required to be vaccinated and at this point boosted as well, um, and any changes to that will be shared with the community and again posted to the together.caltech.edu website. So I, you know, if boosters are widely available before the start of classes in the fall, I expect that would be a requirement, but you know, it's just too soon to say at this point, but we do update the community as those decisions are made. And inside the uh, instructional spaces, as of this term anyway, um, we do require you know, masking to happen, and those masks are provided for free, and uh, students are continued to encourage to mask up wherever they feel, and you can always get those through the bookstore, and you can refresh your pack pretty much every week. Yeah, masks are provided for free for students. Cool, okay, and then this is a follow-up to the earlier question. Um, say parents are you know, we have parents from across the country, across the world, um, and we can't, and they can't necessarily access their student. Is who is the person that would be able to support their student if they were noticing those signs of not being themselves or some concerning behavior from the parent side? So who's here on campus? Yeah, and then I yeah. guess how would they get connected to those people? Sure, and that's a lot of what the care, the care team does is help identify who's going to be the person that maybe reaches out to the student, and it might be um, someone who's already connected with the student. That's partly why it's sort of a um, multidisciplinary group of folks. Um, so, you know, typically the, the group would discuss and identify someone to, you know, work with that student more regularly, check in initially, and, and work with them regularly as needed. Um, so it could be a dean, could be um, a counselor, could be, although, you know, obviously that role is confidential, so that's a little bit different. But it's, it's frequently uh, an RA, a residential associate in the, in the halls. Um, or an RLC, which is a professional staff member versus the RA as a, as a graduate student living uh, in the residences. So it really kind of depends. Um, sometimes it's an advisor or a faculty member if they have a really great relationship with someone. So it really depends on who your student bonds with and connects with, and we want them to find those relationships. And if they don't have anyone, we will make one for them and find them, find them a new friend to check in with and, and make sure that they're, they're connected. And if you go to the uh, wellness.caltech.edu website, pretty much every single page, there's going to be a blue button that says submit a care report if you want to look at what that form looks like. Cool, okay. Um, and this one I think is more for Kristen. If a student fails a class, what happens next? <laughs> sure. Um, if a student fails a class, um, if it's a required class, they would have to retake it eventually, but failing a class in and of itself doesn't have any implications necessarily on uh, eligibility and the ability to stay here. Um, students are required to pass at least 27 units, which again would typically be like three full-time classes, um, with at least a 1.9 GPA, with the exception of the first two terms when they don't have a GPA. Um, to move on to the next term. So um, that's kind of the, the base level, but say a student is enrolled in five classes and they fail two, well, as long as they pass the other three with a 1.9 GPA, they can stay enrolled. So it, it really depends. It's, it's always very, um, you know, dependent on a specific student and their circumstances and their enrollment. But typically when they fail a class, um, they'll be meeting with either myself or Leslie Nye, our other 
our other dean um, to talk about their plans. Their advisor is certainly notified if they fail a class. Um, their advisor also gets those midterm uh, deficiency notices along with the deans. And so there are a number of kind of folks looking out and usually a student will say, oh gosh, I already heard from my advisor about this, you know, <laughs> you're reaching out to. But the idea is, you know, obviously we want to make sure that they are getting connected to resources and getting some help. But, um, you know, again, failing the one class, it's, it's not the end of the world. It certainly happens. Um, and like I said, if it is a required course, a student would retake it. Um, it's not removed or replaced on their transcript. They just have the F, but then they also have the new grade when they, when they complete the course again. Um, if it's not required, they might not ever retake it, and that's okay too. Um, but if that were the case, frequently students will drop a class closer to the end of the term if, if they're not doing well and they're not enjoying it and they don't need it, so, yeah. And Grace, question for you. With the workshops you mentioned before, um, just what's some general basis of like how often are they? Is there capacity on those workshops? Um, and how do, can students sign up or get connected to them, just to reiterate? Oh, okay, cool. So all of our workshops are, again, on our website. Um, we have one pretty much every single week, and some of them we repeat every single term just because there's been that continued demand for them. Um, we do book a room, and if the capacity went over, we would definitely um, look into booking a bigger room next time. Um, but generally, we haven't had any issues with room capacity. Um, there's no need to sign up. You would just show up, and for this term, our workshops are in person during lunch. And then um, you also mentioned some pre-recorded workshops. Where can folks find those? Yeah. Um, also, again, on the same page. So if you go to workshops and groups, there's a page that says on-demand workshops, or you could just Google it, right? Um, Caltech Student Wellness Services on-demand workshops, and you can see everything that's been recorded there. So really, um, yeah, there's so many good topics, honestly, right? We have Tackle the Term, which is about how do we look at stress in a positive way? What can we think about? Um, procrastination. How do we set up a schedule that doesn't sound like it's all work and, you know, how do we take care of yourself? What does it mean to get better sleep? How much, what happens during the cycle? What happens week to week? Um, how can we think about procrastination? How do we start on something even when we don't want to? Um, and sometimes we bring in speakers from our emotional well-being series. So these are community th uh, therapists and they might come and give a special topic on imposter syndrome or um, eating well or eat I think we've even had one on breathing, so the topic varies. <laughs> and to throw it back to Kristen a little bit, um, you mentioned earlier that first year not having grades. Um, can you talk more about what that means and maybe some reasoning or how that works here at Caltech? Sure. So for the first two terms, and we are in quarters, so there are three terms to the academic year. Um, but for the first two of those three, students are on pass bail, uh, and that's really by design to allow students to adjust to the curriculum. Um, partly it's sort of, I think, down to just the, the difficulty of the curriculum, but I think also it's, it's that it's um, a pretty dramatic shift for a lot of people in the way of learning. And when I say that, um, part of what I mean is students are expected to work really collaboratively. Um, now, a lot of times students hear that and they think like, oh, I did that one group project in high school and it was terrible and it was, I did all the work for everybody. That's not what collaboration means here. It means actually working collaboratively to solve a problem. And there are all kinds of sort of guidelines and rules about it so that it's not cheating, but it's expected that students are collaborating and working together. Um, there are a lot of problem sets throughout the term, <laughs> throughout the week even, multiple classes, multiple problem sets um, that students are typically, again, expected to be working together, um, not sitting alone in their room or alone in the library, but sitting with a group of five people, for instance, maybe, and talking about the different um, strategies and theories and kind of which, which approach would you apply to this problem and then the work that they do is their own but they're discussing it and they're learning from each other and hey I was stuck on you know part B, um, how did you approach that and, and all of that is quite different than the way that a lot of people are used to learning. Obviously, we're not talking about mem memorization. We're talking about you know problem solving and strategic thinking and, and figuring out how to kind of view it really in a different way rather than alone in front of a textbook or, or in class um, and that kind of thing. So um, 
you know, I think that's sort of the primary driver is just that it's very different, but it is also difficult. Um, and, and giving students a chance to kind of adjust to that learning um, while they are taking really all of our, our core curriculum, which typically includes math, physics, um, chemistry, and humanities throughout the first year. Um, biology fits in there too. Um, and so uh, while, while they're doing all of that, at least in those first two terms, and also making friends and also adjusting to college life and sleep schedule and all of those things, um, being able to just focus on, on passing and you know, on, on really learning versus worrying so much about the grades themselves. If I could give a piece of advice from my most successful students, um, outside of anything I can really teach them, um, the students that thrive the most are the ones that find their friends who start the set early. Um, I can't emphasize like how important that is, but if you find friends who start the set, let's say, one or two days after it comes out, it makes a really big difference than if your group starts to meet at midnight, like the day before the set is due. So by far, um, the people you work with will be like the strongest sources of your success, yeah. I can still teach you lots of awesome skills though, but if you have a group that works early, I really, really recommend sticking with that. Great, I think that's a good note to end on just because we are running out of time. So let's give our Kristen and Grace a round of applause again. And they'll be sticking around, you know, if you want to ask them questions, but the next session is the JPL panel that will be happening in this room. So feel free to hang out keep your seat, um, or walk around outside. I know it's a sunny day, so thank you all for being here and continue to f have fun in discotheque.
Hello, everybody. Welcome to the main event. As if anything else wasn't the main event. Discotech is the main event. So, how's your day going? Yeah, no, let's hear it. How's your day going? Good. I hope you're all getting exhausted and having a wonderful time. Couple quick housekeeping things. Please keep your arms and legs inside the car at all times. Exits could be down front, could be in back of you, so in case of emergency, just follow the lights along the aisle. That's what I was instructed to say. So I am honored and excited to introduce you to today's panelists from NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. JPL is the Center of Robotic Space Exploration, as well as the study of our home planet. And as you might be aware, it is owned by NASA and managed by Caltech, meaning JPL is part of Caltech. The relationship affords opportunities for our students to do research at JPL, to have internships at JPL. There's a lot involved. And for this session, we're going to have each of our panelists introduce themselves, talk about what they do at Jet Propulsion Lab, and why they chose both Caltech and JPL. We'll have time for questions and answers, so please use your Slido. The link is in the session information, and I will come up and relay those questions to them. So with that, I'll turn the program over to Ashwin. Hi, everybody. So um, I'm apparently Dr. Ashwin Vasavada, the only doctor, even though there's other PhDs up here. I think that's because I'm representing the last century, and they're doing, <laughs> they were kind uh, because I'm a senior, I guess. I'm not really, but um, good to meet all of you and uh, happy to start out with telling you a little bit about uh, our careers at JPL. So I work on the Curiosity uh, Mars rover mission. You'll see there's a theme about Mars rovers up here. I'm currently the project scientist on the mission and I'll tell you a little bit about what that means. Uh, and that's the rover, of course. Uh, we. we uh, don't have anybody up there taking pictures for us, but we do have a camera at the end of the robotic arm, probably all familiar with that by now, um, but we can take selfies. <laughs> uh, so I, I thought, you know, when you're talking about a career uh, and how you get from uh, where you are today and where I was in the last century to uh, JPL, sometimes it's not a straight path, and so it's kind of fun for me to recollect the crazy journey I took part of which is driven by the nature of uh, space exploration uh, generally. Uh, but when I was an undergraduate, I worked on a project uh, where uh, JPL, uh, I wasn't working there at the time, I was at UCLA, JPL was taking some of its dishes that it uses to communicate with uh, spacecraft and illuminating uh, Mercury and seeing what bounced off of Mercury. And they turned out that long before there was ever knowledge of ice on the moon, there was ice on Mercury, and that's what these bright spots are. Uh, and there still is today, but we haven't gone there yet to look at it. Um, but nevertheless, I did some undergraduate work there, and that was enough to uh, get me into Caltech as a grad student. I thought, now I'm going to move to Mars, because Mars is the cool planet. And um, I went there to go work on a spacecraft called Mars Observer, which is this guy right here, which blew up uh, right before entering Mars orbit. And so there was a three-year gap from 1993 to 1996, where I just took my qualifying exams and thought about what I would do with my life. And uh, my advisor here at Caltech said, how, how about we work on uh, Jupiter? There's a spacecraft about to get to Jupiter. So it's like, what the heck? I like Mars, but I can do Jupiter. Uh, and <laughs> got to go with what works sometimes in planetary science. Uh, and so this is Jupiter. Uh, we spent a lot of time doing image processing and meteorology on the giant planets. And then I thought, you know, for my postdoc after graduating, now I'm going to go to Mars because Mars is still the cool planet. And I started, uh, and I got a great job to work on a spacecraft called the Mars Polar Lander, uh, which uh, crashed just, <laughs> just before arriving at Mars. And so that postdoc was um, really fun for like a year, trying to get ready for uh, the mission to land and being super involved in the inside of a Mars mission for the first time. This was back at UCLA again, where the mission was being uh, run scientifically. Uh, but then it crashed, and I had to figure out what to do. So I did a second postdoc and went back to my old 
PhD advisor, and did a postdoc with him, and he said, how do you like Saturn? <laughs> I said, oh, I, <laughs> I can do Saturn. Uh, there is a spacecraft called Cassini that I worked on as my second postdoc. And then finally, I'm like, you know, forget spacecraft. They're too um, unpredictable. So I'll just go be a professor. So I was a professor for a couple years at UCLA after that. And then finally, I kind of got the dream job in uh, 2004, and I was hired to work as uh, the deputy project scientist for uh, the Curiosity rover mission, which uh, is, um, means that along with the project scientist, we help run the entire science team. And that mission has been a wonderful success. No explosions, no crashing. Just lots of great science. <laughs> Um, and here's um, what, you know, part of what we do at JPL, we build Mars rovers, have done that for, for a few decades now. This is kind of the rover family portrait, uh, starting with um, the Sojourner rover in 1996, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers in uh, 2003, I think, and four, around there, they launched and landed. And then Curiosity and Perseverance share this same uh, size in 2011, 2020. Uh, and so we get to work with this big beast of a rover with all these instruments and a science team of about 500 people. And I will quickly get to the end here. Uh, but what does a project scientist do? Sorry, I have to try to read this. Oh my gosh, it's hard to read. But I help, <laughs> <laughs> help define and execute the science objectives of the mission. So um, along with 500 other scientists around the world, we, we make, basically make sure the science gets done. Uh, we uh, make design choices. So I was involved in, with Curiosity from the time it was still in blueprints to the present. Uh, and so there was a lot of choices to be made where things came over budget or were hard to accomplish from an engineering perspective. And we had to figure out how to make those compromises to still do the right science with the capabilities the rover could have. Uh, we organized the international science team. Uh, we main the scientific in, maintain the scientific integrity of the mission. So uh, the public, you know, we work for them as a taxpayer-funded mission, and we have to honestly tell the public what we're discovering and make sure we have credibility behind what we claim to discover. And that's part of my job, too. Uh, and the most fun part of the job is, like I'm doing right now, get to be a spokesperson for the mission. And with that, I will turn it over to Vivian. Awesome. Thank you, Ashwin. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to meet you, and it's great to see you all here at Prefrosh Weekend. Uh, so my name is Vivian Sun, and uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself um, for context. I grew up in central New Jersey, so if there's anyone else from the East Coast out here representing, hooray. <laughs> awesome. Glad you guys made the trip out here. Um, let's see, so I, my Caltech connection uh, started when I was an undergrad here at Caltech. Um, I joined in uh, 2008 and I graduated in the class of 2012. Um, I am a Rudd from Ruddick House. And uh, yeah, my major then was, oh, did I press something? Okay. My major um, was planetary science. I'll talk a little bit about how I kind of actually got there because it wasn't quite that straightforward, um, you know, right when I was in your position in at Prefrosh Weekend. Um, I did uh, go on after my bachelor's uh, right into a graduate school program, so I went, to, I went back to the East Coast, which was an interesting contrast after four years here. Um, but I got my master's and my PhD also in planetary science from Brown University. Um, and then uh, that takes me more or less now to where um, I am now. Um, so ever since graduating with my PhD, I uh, took a postdoctoral fellowship at JPL and then I transitioned to being a full-time employee at JPL. Um, and I'm currently working as a science operations systems engineer, which if you asked me 10 years ago uh, what that was, I would have no idea. Um, <laughs> but um, right now I'm working on the Mars 2020 Perseverance mission. So um, a rover that you'll see has many similarities with the Curiosity rover, um, as well as differences. But um, definitely mission uh, operations and mission work is very much a part of my life now, and, and that's a good thing for me. Um, and you can see here on the right is just a fun picture um, at JPL's Mars Yard, which Ashwin just showed a picture from as well. Um, but what I'm holding is actually a true-to-size model of Perseverance's um, turret at the end of its robotic arm. Um, and that turret has uh, some of our science instruments like Pixel and Sherlock and Watson. So if you've seen any like high-resolution images uh, returned from the Perseverance mission, it's probably taken from uh, one of those instruments. Um, and then, of course, it also has the drill, which we use to, you know, drill and core uh, samples for future sample return. All right, so um, I'll talk a little bit about why I chose Caltech uh, more than a decade ago now. Um, but 
you know, basically, I think um, perhaps similar to some of you out there, um, I was I knew I was interested in the space sciences. Um, I actually uh, started out thinking I wanted to be an astrophysicist because that's what you know that's what I knew at the time uh, from high school. Um, but then I got here. I took some classes. I learned that there was a field called planetary science where you actually learn about like the it's it's more geology focused. You learn about the actual rocks and possible atmospheres that you know uh, compose the different planets in our solar system, and I thought that was so much fun. That was so exciting um, that I kind of I kind of switched and did a little shift from astrophysics to planetary science. Um, but in any case, you know, I knew Caltech was a great place because of um, you know the great departments in both geology, planetary sciences, and astrophysics. So I knew it was a great place to be um, even before I came here. Um, and of course, another big hit for me personally was Prefrosh Weekend, so I hope you guys kind of find yourself in a similar situation as I did, because you know, I already kind of knew that I wanted to come to Caltech as an undergraduate, um, or as a Prefrosh, I should say. Um, but then it was really when I came to, to Prefrosh Weekend, it really just sealed the deal for me. You know, like There was just so many things that we did just in those short few days um, that you know, four years later, you know, I look back and I'm like, you know, that was a very representative um, you know, pre-frosh experience. It was like very similar to what I um, you know, eventually experienced in my four years here, and it was all the good stuff. Um, so what I really liked about Caltech, um, and I still like about Caltech, is you know, we have the house system. Um, I think people like to, I remember when we did um, tours and stuff, we would always kind of compare it to like the house system at Harry Potter, you know, like you have groups of um, groups of students living in the same house. You build really, really close connections with those people. Like some of my best friends now are still from, you know, my house or from when, um, or you know, like the connections that you made during the four years um, that you were here. So those are still some of my, you know, longest lasting um, relationships are with those folks. Um, yeah, it's a close knit community. It's a very small student population here relative to some of the other colleges. Um, and of course, that has advantages academically, but also just, you know, it's, I liked being able to, uh, you know, like know all the faces on campus. If I don't know your name, you know, at least I, your face is familiar or vice versa. Um, and of course, I can't, uh, you know, say why I chose Caltech without mentioning all of the fantastic research opportunities that are available here. So, you know, it's not just the classes that you take, but what I really found was unique about Caltech was just how many research opportunities there were for an undergrad to get involved in. Um, like, even as a freshman, you know, so many people just started getting involved in research. I didn't really know what research was, but like, you know, you still get involved. Um, and there's so many different types of things to choose from. So, you know, even though I came in, I was just finding out what planetary science was. Um, so I kind of dabbled around in different um, summer projects. And we have a program called uh, SURF, the SURF program, Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship. Um, and that was just, you know, such a fantastic program. Every summer I was fortunate enough to take an opportunity to kind of explore different things. So one year, you know, I did a geobiology um, research project where we were looking for fossils. We took a field trip out to Nevada, looked for fossils, and then came back and, you know, did a whole bunch of cool science with it in the lab. Um, we also, I also did, um, you know, a project studying Jupiter spots. I did not stick with, um, you know, a Jupiter project in the end, but it was a cool kind of foray into like, what is it like to study the atmosphere of a, of a gas giant in our planet, in our solar system? Um, and then what really kind of, uh, I guess, like set me on my future path was um, the last research project that I did uh, in my junior year summer, or senior year summer, um, but it was actually at JPL. And this was a project looking at dust devil tracks on the surface of Mars to try to figure out, you know, what are the wind patterns on Mars? Do they change over time? Um, and that was really such a cool project, I felt, for me, that um, it inspired me to apply to graduate school, um, you know, do research four or five years as a graduate student at Brown University. Um, and then that's kind of also where, uh, how it took me back to Caltech, was um, getting involved with rover operations on the Curiosity mission, um, you know, being part of the team that Ashwin mentioned, um, doing operations as a graduate student, and then uh, that was how I kind of found my way back to JPL um, to do a postdoc, uh, working on curiosity uh, things as well as some uh, perseverance um, research activities. So um, that kind of takes me to that second bullet point, but um, you know, I came to JPL as a postdoc, um, you know, after my first internship. Uh, I participated on the Curiosity mission, doing operations. It was, it's so different doing it in person at JPL. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's fun to participate in the mission normally, but it was extra fun to be at JPL meeting all the engineers and seeing how, you know, the rover really operates um, from the engineering side. 
Um, and then I also participated with um, the, the Perseverance Science team back when we were still deciding what landing site to go to. Um, there were a whole bunch of workshops that you know, Caltech was super involved in, JPL was super involved in, um, just trying to decide where are we actually gonna land this Perseverance rover, and of course now we know that we're at Jezero Crater. Um, and so that kind of takes me to where I currently am um, through, through a series of events. Um, I am now a systems engineer at JPL, and my current job is uh, being the science operations team lead. Um, and so what we do there is, um, there's a counterpart on Curiosity as well, and we work really closely with the project science team to basically make sure that we're efficiently running the rover. We are kind of the bridge between the science team and the engineering team, making sure that, you know, knowing that you have knowledge of kind of both realms um, and working to make sure that you're packing as much science as you can into the plans that we send to the rover every single day. Um, so with that, I'll just leave you with uh, a super cool um, video. I think uh, if you can, uh, please go onto YouTube to find this, but this was just, this is some of the things that still, uh, I think I just find so amazing, even just more than a year later. So this was, uh, this is actual video from when Perseverance landed on February 18th, just one, a little more than one year ago. Um, and so if this replays again, on the right is kind of the camera looking down at the ground as Perseverance is being lowered to the ground. Um, in the left images, you see you're looking up at the sky crane, and then you're also looking down from the sky crane at the rover. And so this is all happening at the same time. Um, but I think this was the first event where we had, you know, documentation of such quality of, um, during a landing event. And so this is just, you know, I wanted to show this as just one of the really cool things that, you know, we're able to accomplish at JPL and Caltech. And there's so many people from the Caltech and JPL communities who are, of course, involved in, in this and are still involved. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to you, Harold. Hello there, everyone. My name is Harel Dor. I use they, them, and I'm going to be talking to you about my work at JPL. First off, a little bit about myself. I am uh, a bachelor's recipient from Caltech. I graduated in 2020. I started at JPL in August of 2020, and if you're doing your math correctly, yes, I started during the pandemic. I have an office on lab, and I've worked there for less than seven days total. <laughs> I got my bachelor's in applied physics and computer science. I actually came into Caltech intending to do a physics degree, and I found myself increasingly pulled more and more away from the more theoretical aspects of my studies and more towards the applications of them and how I could actually take what I was learning and use it in the real world. And I initially was saying to myself, okay, I'll do an applied physics degree. It's the same classes pretty much, but you get applied in the name, and the research topics are slightly different, but I still feel like I want more skills that I can see myself using in my day to day, and I started to take more and more computer science classes until I found myself having a double major by accident. <laughs> I was a member of Dabney and Blacker House. I rotated into Dabney and joined Blacker at the end of my sophomore year. Uh, the house system was a huge draw of what pulled me into Caltech. When I uh, was initially applying to colleges, I'd actually never heard of Caltech before. And my school's guidance program uh, introduced me to the school and started my quest for more knowledge about it. And I started looking up, everyone's seen the Wikipedia article, House System at California Institute of Technology. A lot of what's on that article is incorrect or outdated, but it very much pulled me in and got me interested in learning more about the school. Uh, while I was here, I also spent two years as the Conduct Review Committee student co-chair. The CRC, or CRAC, is one of the two uh, honor code um, uh, bodies that uh, helps with enforcement and application of the honor code. So the CRAC is the non-academic portion of that there is another one called the Board of Control, the BOC, that does academic things, but you'll get more information about this in other places. Um, it was just, I felt really attached to the honor code and wanted to do my part to help uphold it and, and be a part of it, and it was a very educational experience uh, for my time at Caltech. Um, in my work at JPL, 
I am a robotic systems engineer. What does that mean? Anything you want it to. <laughs> I work on robots. I don't work on any particular part of a robot. I work in the robotic interfaces and visualization group, which means I sometimes work on things that make images. Sometimes they don't. <laughs> really, it's um, very interesting at JPL how what your job title is isn't necessarily related to the work that you do. There are so many different avenues for career advancement, so many different things that you can do, and it's not tied to what you were hired for, and it's not tied to what you're doing right now. There's a lot of opportunities for lateral movement and exploration of your uh, interests. So I already talked a little bit about why I decided to go to Caltech. A lot of it was the social atmosphere and just how I felt, especially when I visited for my uh, pre-fresh weekend experience. I was really drawn in by the, uh, the students, the way that they interacted with each other, the way that I could tell that they took the honor code seriously and it really imbued every single portion of student life and how the house system created this network of support that made it feel like you, you weren't alone in your experience. It, one thing that people always told me is, at other schools, the students might be against each other and they might feel like they're competing for good grades, but at Caltech, the students are all competing with the work. They're all working together to do the work. As for why I picked JPL, it's the coolest stuff on any planet. <laughs> you can see on the left, uh, Ashwin showed us a lovely selfie from Curiosity. This is how those selfies are taken. You can see the arm sort of gesticulating to move the camera on Curiosity. The camera is called Molly. Um, and it's sort of swiveling around to get every possible view. And we take so many images and then stitch them together into one mosaic image. This is greatly sped up. I think it's 130 times real time. Um, on the right, you can see the same uh, landing video that Vivian showed you. And in the middle, you can see some uh, navcam images from the Mars Helicopter Ingenuity. This is looking down. I don't know which flight this is from, but uh, while the helicopter flies, it's taking images of the local terrain to help it figure out where it is and where it's going. So JPL does some of the most interesting work, I think, of really any organization anywhere. And I really couldn't imagine myself working anywhere else. I knew that I wanted to work in space. They call it the aerospace industry, but I wasn't really interested in the aeronautical portions of it. I wanted to work with teams that worked on the hardest problems, working on things that go to the farthest places. And JPL is really one of the only places that actually can do that. So what do I do? I am a uh, Mars, surf what is it? Mars Scientific Laboratory, MSL, also known as Curiosity Rover Planner, and an Ingenuity Helicopter Operator. So I drive a rover and I fly a helicopter. And that is 99% of my day-to-day -day job. Uh, it's really cool, it's really fun. It is very stressful at times, but most of the time it is very rewarding. And what that actually means from a day-to-day -day perspective is that people from the science team, like Ashwin and Vivian, will tell me, we saw a rock over there, it looks really, really cool. Can we get up to it and maybe put our cameras on it and our sensors? And I will look at the field of daggers between us and that rock. <laughs> And I will do my very best to find a way to safely get the rover over to that rock to get those pretty pictures. But sometimes I have to tell them it's just too dangerous, we can't go. Uh, the uh, mechanics of this job involves using a lot of in-house programs for visualizing the rover and the local terrain and planning out uh, what we're going to do. We don't plan things out in real time. There's too much light lag between Earth and Mars. We couldn't possibly uh, react to things in time. And in fact, what we do is we plan a whole day's worth of activities or multiple whole day's worth of activities in one go. And then we send them up 
and the next day or the next few days we come back and look at the results. So it's a lot of long-term planning, it's a lot of figuring out contingencies for if this thing didn't work, how will the rover react and what will we do and how do we make sure that we end up in a safe state at the end of it. Helicopter operations is very similar and also very different because the helicopter is a very small mission that is not supposed to be still in operation. The helicopter was planned out for a very short uh, operational lifetime and we have exceeded it by so much that we had to hire an entire new ops team to take over because the old one had other obligations. I'm part of that new team. So I have only been flying the helicopter for a few months. Um, and it is a lot more um, sort of as we go. Uh, there's not as many ingrained rules and ideas about how things work and how we need to do things as there are on Curiosity, where we've been doing this for years and years, and we know what works and we know what doesn't work. With the helicopter, we're constantly learning. We are uh, trying things out and seeing what sticks, and sometimes we need to pull back and reconsider. And it's just uh, really a, a one-of-a-kind, unique experience that I'm so happy that I get to have. So I'm gonna hand it off. I know you don't have slides, so here's a nice nope. blank one. <laughs> I can go back to the first one, right? Yeah. Leave it on the blank one? Okay. Right. So I don't have slides because I work with the aliens, and I wasn't allowed to put any slides in. Don't tell anyone. Uh, so my name is Amy Hoffman, Dr. Amy Hoffman. I, did, uh, I received my PhD here at Caltech in geochemistry in 2010. Um, I took a different path to my career. I mean, everyone takes a different path, right? But uh, to emphasize how different it is, so I'm from rural Pennsylvania, so East Coast, yeah. Um, I went to college at a small liberal arts college called Franklin and Marshall in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It's where the, the Amish are more or less from. I am not Amish, but that's what people seem to know it for. Uh, I, was, I basically made up my own major, which was practically just a mixture of everything I did, but more or less an English major. So yes, that is right. It, I was not a space physicist, I was not an applied physicist, I was not a planetary scientist. I took a bunch of geology classes, but I was effectively more or less English major, something to that effect. Uh, but it was at the end of my time as an undergrad that I realized I really wanted to do planetary, mineralogy, the early earth, habitability, origins of life, that sort of thing. And so I had to work for a year and take classes part-time to apply to graduate school. And I almost didn't apply to Caltech uh, because I didn't think I'd get in. I didn't think I was smart enough. I didn't think I was good enough. I didn't think I had the background to do it. And I imagine that some of you out there may have fe felt a comparable sort of imposter syndrome when you applied. Maybe not. If you didn't, kudos to you. That's awesome that you have that level of self-confidence at your age, but I did not, and yet somehow I ended up coming, getting in, I came to visit just like you're doing now but for the grad student weekend, and I knew within meeting my fellow potential uh, fellow graduate students, I knew immediately that Caltech was the right place for me. Why? Because these were my people. And I've never really left. I can tell you where my career took me before I got back to JPL, but I've always been coming back to Caltech over and over and over again because this is my intellectual home. And so why did I know this right away? Well, a bunch of us, so we're geologists, geochemists, geophysicists, geobiologists. I don't even think the planetary kids came with us. I don't think they were <laughs> invited for some reason. They had like their own separate thing. Um, so we went to dinner and one of my fellow uh, grad students who became a good friend uh, told this joke, and he said, so here's the joke, right? A black bear and a white bear jump into a river. Which one dissolves first? <laughs> I know some of you know it because you're laughing. The white one, because it's polar. Womp womp, right? Yes, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'll tell Andrew you guys appreciated that, right? And you know, it sounds stupid, right? But that was the moment I knew. I'm like, these are my people, because we all <laughs> laughed. Nobody felt insecure that I could tell. You know, we all were like, wow, everybody came. You said people work together, right? In, in graduate school, it's the exact same thing. Everybody came in with different areas of expertise, 
You know, I was a decent writer, having had this crazy English major background, um, but there were things I was deficient in, and so everyone was really there to build one another up, help, help one another through the process, work on our problem sets together. It was very collaborative, which was not what most people that I knew, most people I knew who, when I told them I was going to Caltech, they were like, oh, oh no. Like I was gonna get eaten up, you know, chewed up and, and spit out, and it was not the case, or maybe I'm just a masochist because I keep coming back. <laughs> So I ended up working on early earth, uh, early earth mineralogy. Um, I did a bunch of different things, analytical work, experimental work. I went to Berkeley for my postdoc and learned computational chemistry. Uh, I took a bunch of different classes in different departments and divisions here. I highly recommend that you do that. And also, you know, don't hate on your hum classes because the humanities, I had so many undergrads who hated on their hum classes, but the humanities just provide a different way of thinking about our place in the world. Yes, I'm an Engli I was a former English major saying this, but it's valuable, okay? So just remember that someone from JPL told you don't to hate on your hum classes. Uh, so after my postdoc, I went back to my alma mater as a professor uh, at a liberal arts college, right, in the chemistry department. And why? Because I wanted to pay it forward and work with undergraduates. Without my mentors, I wouldn't be where I am today. And, and you've heard from the other three people up here that it was really their, you know, their advisors were helping them through many crashed spacecraft <laughs> and all kinds of cool research projects and you were working with probably people in, in a whole bunch of different, uh, different divisions because you were cross, going cross-disciplinary with different stuff. Find someone when you're here that you connect with. Do those research projects, seek that out, right? Take that initiative because those people will help you as you start to discover and find your path. That was why I went back to be a professor. But when the opportunity came to come to the coolest place there is, yes, I jumped ship and came to JPL where I'm a research scientist now. So what do I do? Every day is a little bit different, which is super cool. So I'm in the planetary sciences section. Somehow I ended up being a planetary scientist at the end of the day anyway. I do a mixture of my own research. So I'm an isotope geochemist, which, sound, which sounds esoteric, but really it's just I use isotopes to do like CSI, fill in the name of the planet. CSI Venus, CSI Mars. Isotopes are a great way for us to trace processes like the water cycle on Earth. I owe Ashwin a paper on uh, Mars water. It'll get there. Um, I, <laughs> I do research down at Caltech, so this is a great way to stay connected. For me, I get to work with graduate students and undergraduates, whether they're interns or they're working with me or for me. I'm back down here in the labs, uh, so it's, it's that fantastic way to bridge the, the communities. Um, you know, JPL and Caltech, we really are, we're, we're tight. Um, and so I, I come up with my own research projects, which is awesome. Um, I also work on developing instruments for, for space, so I work on one of the instruments, Ashwin showed a picture of this big box with a bunch of pipes and valves and stuff in it. That's the, the mass spectrometer from uh, Curiosity. I work on a tiny piece of that. That's where the data that I owe him a paper on uh, comes from. But I'm also helping build a version of one of those instruments to go to Venus in a mission that was just selected uh, called Da Vinci. We're going to, in about eight years, uh, transcend through or descend through Venus's atmosphere and finally get a look at what it's like below the clouds, hopefully not clogging our inlets like past missions. We'll see. Um, but I also work in mission formulation, so this is the last thing I'll say. I wear another hat, which is I'm the program scientist for planetary science and instruments formulation at JPL. So what that means is I get to play in one of the, in the early stages of mission development. You have an idea for a mission, you have a big question that you want to answer, Let's get together, we get the engineers together, we get like a little JPL think tank, basically, um, together, and we start to come up with, is this feasible? How would we address these science questions? What are your bigger science questions? Uh, and start to, to plan out and work and work and work, and sometimes it turns out you can't do it, but then other times you realize that this is a mission concept that could really go forward, and so for me it's a lot of fun to work with engineers and people that develop payloads, so instruments for flight, and the scientists, and like work in that triangle where it's trying to make sure that all of these pieces that need to talk to one another uh, come together. And I never, that I never anticipated being at JPL, and I was just like, woo, space, here we go. 
But learning how to speak the, you know, it's, it's a different lexicon. Engineers and scientists often speak like this. And so learning to try to build those bridges has, has definitely been um, a lot of fun. And I'm blathering, so I will stop because I know you guys probably have questions. No, I can't tell you where the aliens are. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll stop there. Amy, were you looking at the Slido? That's really one of the questions <laughs> that came in through the Slido. And the most popular comment was bring Pluto back as a planet. <laughs> JPL had nothing to do with demoting Pluto. Mike Brown. That was Professor Mike Brown at Caltech. So you can find him. But he found another one. His, his daughter was very young when Pluto was demoted and she said, Dad, why'd you have to do that? Find another one. So he did. Um, but moving on to the serious questions. Uh, do specific majors at Caltech do specific work? So would computer scientists be in one division at JPL and bioengineering in another, or is it more cross-disciplinary? And y'all touched on this a bit, but I'd like you to speak specifically to this, if you would. I think I can take that one. I, like I said, started out in one discipline, moved to another. My freshman surf was in bioengineering. Um, there's really just no strict rules about what disciplines work on what stuff. You can take any ex expertise and apply it to any problem and you'll be able to do something. I'm gonna add one thing. This is the pedantic professor hat coming back. I guess you didn't have one of those. I, I totally did. <laughs> Which is, if you learn how to think critically and write critically, that goes everywhere, right? It doesn't matter what your major was at the end of the day. That's a skill, that's a lifelong skill. Nice. Why do you think space exploration is important or relevant? It's a philosophical, philosophical crowd here. <laughs> Gosh, I'm, I'm sure we have, um, you know, five opinions between the four of us or more. Uh, but one thing we often say, you know, when we talk about our rover mission is that um, if you know, right now, here we are in this advanced time, 21st century, and we still don't know of any life outside of our one planet, and yet we know that there are thousands of planets even within, you know, that we can already see with, with our instrumentation, and there's just untold numbers in other systems and other galaxies. So, you know, finding evidence of life uh, in the solar system anywhere would be one of the most fundamental discoveries of all of all time, of, of humanity. And that's what has driven a lot of what we do with Curiosity and then Perseverance, as well as many other missions that JPL work on. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, maybe just, yeah, I, I think um, maybe the askers of this philosophical question will appreciate a philosophical answer, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I, I really think space exploration is a way for us to understand, like, why we are here, too, mm -hmm. right? Um, because there is, you know, if you, and this is something I learned in my undergraduate classes here, but um, just thinking about the whole history of the universe and how, you know, our, our solar system formed, how all the different planets formed, and then, you know, thinking about there's, you know, there's eight planets, other planetary bodies in our system, you know, why is it that there's only life here on Earth, like Ashwin said? Um, and so that's just kind of, you know, it's, an, it's a very, it's an odd question, right? And I think just wanting to get the answer um, to that, understanding like what were the set of circumstances that, you know, allowed us to exist here in this day and time, um, I think that's, that's something that's really important um, for a lot of people to, to think about. Anyone else? As much as I am a scientist at heart, I do have to give the engineer's answer for a little bit. And that is that there's so many technologies and uh, techniques that are developed for space exploration that come back around and help us on Earth. And so many missions that NASA and JPL do, which are centered around our Earth and climate science and understanding our planet and helping us live here. And yes, we are looking to the stars, but when we do so, everything that we learn helps us in our lives here. 
All right, I'll give my fifth opinion. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think about this a lot because I think about what good am I doing for the world if I'm, you know, going, getting data, doing esoteric science. And I think it comes, to me, it comes down to the fact that humans are innately curious and that's something that we all feel to some degree. If you think about when the most recent cosmonauts went up to the space station, right, they're all there, they're all working together. Yes, there's all kinds of strife and things happening on this planet, but this wanting to know, this, this desire to understand, this curiosity brings us together. And maybe it's just the, you know, naive, I wish the world were like Star Trek uh, vision where those things, this exploration would bring humanity together in a way that other things don't. I still hold on to that because I think it inspires, right? I think it inspires the next generation to think about what's possible across all of these, everything that, that they've said, and more. So there are two more questions that I really want to get in here. There are a lot of really great questions in here. One is, and please, you could be brief on this if you'd like, what are your thoughts on the Martian book and movie? Project Hail Mary is better. <laughs> I uh, wasn't there, but I heard a story about JPL attending a screening of it when it first came out and people in the audience heckling about inaccuracies and saying, I built that panel, that's not where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not really good at uh, remembering movies personally, but I do remember, um, you know, obviously a lot of the scenes were set to be at JPL, so it was fun just, you know, I guess when I was watching it, I was the one person from JPL, so I was the uh, kind of, you know, the annoying nag on the side, just being like, this is not how JPL looks. <laughs> I'll, I'll have, I mean, I don't disagree with any of that, but I, a more positive take for the movie, at least, is uh, I thought my favorite part is how they depicted JPL as being the place where everybody wore, like, shirt sleeves, had, like, diversity, you know, gender, ethnic diversity, and all the suits at, at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. were, like, not that. And I thought, like, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll have the last question, and I do have more after the last question. Uh, but what advice or comments do you have for students who are considering both Caltech and other comparable universities? You don't have to name names of other universities if you don't want. Go to Caltech. <laughs> <laughs> That's good advice, generally. Um, yeah, I, advice, geez. Uh, advice? <laughs> You've left them speechless. Yeah. I guess um, I would say... Yeah, I guess the, my question is like how comparable is comparable, right? Because um, I think there are some things that are very unique to Caltech um, that you know when I was a when I was a perspective I did not see in other universities, and that's why it was such an easy choice for me. Um, but you know, I, I think I kind of mentioned two. Th I think we already mentioned kind of two things um, just in the panel here. But one is of course the small community. It's a very small student body, very close knit. You know, um, I think there's a lot of positives that come with that. Um, and then I think the second is just kind of like the, the culture that we have here, like the student culture, um, you know, and that's, that's extending to both, you know, undergrads and graduate students. Like, I, I don't think I've, I haven't been to that many other university campuses, but um, it really struck me how, you know, the undergrads um, here, like, you know, all know each other. They know the graduate students and vice versa, like in the department that they're working in, everyone gets really close through, you know, research projects and just kind of the overall environment, you know, it was just, it was, it was really fun for me to be a student here as an undergrad, um, and it was apparent to me even during pre-frosh weekend, so I kind of hope that's a similar case for you guys too. I guess my perspective is if you're debating between this school and other schools, focus more on the social and experiential aspects of that decision, the type of school, the size, the location, the vibes, because you're going to be able to find an excellent academic experience at almost any school you go to. And if you're worried about whether or not you can handle the academics at Caltech, well, you got admitted. So really focus on how it feels to be here, if you're enjoying it, what you want out of your college experience. 
I'll, I'll just add one other kind of piece of advice, which was important for me, and I think it kind of follows on some of what Vivian shared too, is uh, take the time to expose yourself to a lot of different um, experiences. Uh, and I'm talking in this context academically, but there's lots of other experiences too. But to find, to, to end up where we all ended up, w w none of us really took a, that linear of a path. And part of that is just, you know, you, you, what, it, it takes doing something for investing a little time and doing something to figure out if you really connect with that thing and, and that becomes your passion or not. So I worked on a lot of different planets. I worked on a lot of different types of science uh, and even little bits of engineering here and there before I really found what the thing was that really motivated me. Uh, and I think that's different for each of us, but has propelled us to where we are in our careers because you end up really falling in love with that, that thing and you want to make it your, your life's work. I would just say um, that, because I know there are those of you out there who will resonate with this because I would have uh, sitting in your seat, there is no perfect answer. There is no perfect or quote unquote right with a capital R decision. You have to make, you got to trust yourself to make the best choice you can, given these sorts of things to consider, and then, you know, own it. Go with it. And if that means you decide to come to Caltech, awesome. Own that. But remember also that these decisions don't close all the doors, right? You may decide you to come to Caltech and then maybe, sorry, blasphemy, you decide that's not the place for you. That's fine. It's fine. So, you know, just don't hold yourself to an unreasonable standard that you have to know the answer and it has to be the right answer because those things always change. There is no perfect. Perfect. I'd like to invite Diego up to the stage right now with a couple announcements. Hi, everyone. Um, one, let's uh, thank our fantastic panel once again for taking time out of their day to be with us. Um, I'm Diego, I'm a senior undergrad, I study physics, I work with the admissions office, and um, I've been told before I tell you all where to go next, uh, to share my own Caltech success story, since we've heard some from this stage. Uh, I've been accepted to the University of Colorado at Boulder where I will go to pursue my graduate studies. And yesterday I found out that I was selected by the National Science Foundation to receive the Graduate Research Fellowship. Um, and that was wonderful news, but I certainly wouldn't be where I am, like they all said, without the mentorship and help that I found from my professors and my peers at Caltech. So um, that's a story to share with you. Uh, we have plenty of other stuff for you to do today. Um, if you want to see our beautiful campus, there are campus tours just outside in the Beckman Mall. They'll be leaving shortly. Um, there's going to be a session on diversity and inclusion at Caltech at Ramo Auditorium, which is just down the walk outside this building. Uh, for students, if you want to get a taste of the problem sets that you will be competing against, um, we have a chance to experience just those problems with current techers at the Southfields. Um, where uh, people will direct you if you can ask questions. But if you were here yesterday, that's where you had dinner. Um, and if you don't want to walk, you just want to stay here, we will have a session on living and learning as a tacker uh, right here where you are. So stay where you are for that session. Uh, thanks so much for coming. We hope that you have a fantastic few days here. <laughs>
Joanna Araujo. I'm Senior Associate Director of Admissions here at Caltech. And in about another minute or so, we're going to go ahead and get started with our panel. I will be introducing the session, and it will be moderated by our, um, our great team up here of Residential Life. And then as a reminder, we are using Slido this afternoon for this session, as well as the other sessions. So if you go onto your Slido, either app or the browser, you're able to find the Slido for this particular session. I can share with you that the Slido number for this session is 456334. So that's where you can add your questions. And about 10 minutes before the end of the session, we'll get started with questions. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. It's so nice to be back in person, to be back and able to share Caltech with you on campus live, and welcome to those of you that are watching this remotely. My name is Felicia Hunt, and I am the Assistant Vice President for the Student Affairs and the Residential Experience, and it's a pleasure to be here. So happy that those of you who traveled are able to be in Pasadena. After a cloudy day yesterday and a cloudy morning, it is another sunny day in Southern California. And it wouldn't be any fun if I didn't remind all of you that in California we rarely wear jackets and we don't own rain boots. Um, I have to start our session by saying that it is a comfortable 72 outside and that's the way we like it here in Pasadena and at Caltech. And it wouldn't be a fun visit weekend if we didn't just, for the purposes of comparison, remind you that a 72 here in Pasadena is a big difference from the 37 degrees that they woke up to in Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> or just a quick reminder that it was 48 degrees and cloudy in Palo Alto. And I understand that it's snowing in Ithaca, New York just a few randomly selected cities that I thought I would share for a comparison. <laughs> but seriously, welcome to our session on living and learning as a techer here in our community. We are thrilled to be here. We wanna give you a window into what it's like to be on campus. What is the campus experience? Well, it's largely built around a residential experience and that's what we're gonna talk about today. You will hear from two staff members in the Office of Residential Experience, which is an office that three of us belong to. We have an RA here, and then we have our fantastic students. So let me tell you a little bit about the Office of Residential Experience. We hate to brag, but we really do think of ourselves as the fun team. We have all of the students in residence. We lead events, we have activities, clubs, pranks, parties, first year experience, and of course, the whole team right here on campus almost all the time. We love to have fun, and I love to say that my work is fun because of the people here that I get to work with. Caltech benefits from a community of the nicest, warmest, kindest, and most engaged students I've ever worked with in my career. You're gonna to get to talk to them today. Our students are the engine of the institute, both at the undergraduate level where we create community, but at the graduate level where we are live-in support teams for the undergraduates, and you'll get to talk to our RA today. And we create this community right here on campus in full. 
See, different from other campuses, almost everybody lives on campus in almost all four years. We have a two-year requirement for first and second year students, so we know that everybody lives here in the beginning and we get to know all of them. But for the most part, everybody stays too because it's that much fun. Our students are living here, they're studying here, they're playing here, they're hanging out together, they're supporting each other 24 seven and that's what we like, that's what makes Caltech stand out. Just to give you a little sense of the numbers of what, I, what this means, we have approximately 950 beds for undergraduate students and our, our enrollment ranges from around 950 to 1000. So you can see that everybody can be here. Right now, 96% of our undergraduate students are living on campus. And we would have more than that if we didn't have to accommodate for isolation or quarantine space during the pandemic. First and second year students come and get to know us and they don't want to leave because it matters that we're all together and that's the way we like it. I think you're going to hear some really special comments about what it's like to be part of our community. And I want to start by asking the panel to introduce themselves so you know who you're hearing from and what their roles are. And then we'll start telling you a little bit about our student support, our resources, and the fun that we have here on campus. So let me start with Vanessa, our Director of Residential Experience. Hi everyone, welcome. I'm excited to see everyone, especially in person. It's been a while. But as Felicia mentioned, my name is Vanessa Tejada and I'm the Director for Residential Experience here at Caltech. Hello. Uh, some of you might recognize me from the career panel. Uh, my name is Adam. I'm a senior studying material science um, and I was the former Blacker House president. Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin. I'm a junior studying bioengineering and I'm the current president of Lloyd House. Hi everyone, my name is Gavin McCabe. Uh, I'm a junior studying quantum information science and I am an unaffiliated student. Hi everyone, my name is Reem. I'm a six year PhD candidate in the biology department and I'm one of the RAs in Bechtel. Hi everyone, my name is Athena. I'm a sophomore here at Caltech studying mechanical engineering and I'm a peer advocate for Fleming House. Hi everybody, it's good to see you. My name is Erica Crawford. I'm the Director of Student Engagement. Thank you everybody. So let's get started with our residential experience and what you can expect and at the end we'll definitely have time for your questions. Vanessa, take it away. Hi everyone, so again welcome. Um, I do oversee the residential experience here at Caltech. So we are made out of 10 residences slash houses, eight houses in particular and then two residences in which your students can live in. Um, we go through a process called rotation. I'm not sure if you've heard of it yet, but it is where students, especially first years, come in. They stay in a room, and then for the first uh, week, week and a half, they kind of go through different events that the houses and the residents have to offer. At the end of that time, they're able to rank the houses and the residents, um, and then we go through an algorithm in, the, in which they're placed. Lots of people like to compare it to Harry Potter or Fraternity Sorority Rush, mm -hmm. but it's definitely a unique process here at Caltech that the students really run, um, and they absolutely love, um, and it's a tradition that continues um, throughout the years. So um, it was really interesting, especially during um, COVID and when we made it virtual, but we're all really excited to have it back in person. Um, let's see. We also have in resident support. So we do have residential life coordinators who live on campus and they're full time staff members um, who provide support, mental health, and are on 24 7 um, emergency on call. Uh, response team alongside other, uh, other team members from campus. We also have an RA and we have an RA here who will talk more about her experience but we have graduate students who also live on campus with the residents and they're able to provide mentoring and advising support. They're also in charge of programming and they work with the student leaders to do that for them. In addition, we also have peer advocate program, an HA program, which is health advocates, Title IX advocates. We really do provide a support system within the house in which students are able to come in and learn the basics like, you know, how to do laundry to, you know, uh, programming, how to pick the next class, how to survive at Caltech, anything like that. And we really do range from you know, having just fun dinners with the students to having like talks about what they can do after. Um, so it's really fun. In addition, we also have faculty and residents um, 
Currently, we have two faculty members who live on campus next to the students, and they also provide an additional resource where they're able to bring in other faculty members to talk to students, provide network opportunities, or just talk about the research. And sometimes they're able to work with these faculties um, if the research matches up. So it's a really fun program. We really do try to make a community from, for the student that's like a home away from home. All right, well, I guess you heard Vanessa talk a little bit about the house system, but just in a little bit more detail, there are eight houses that students can rotate into during rotation. Um, for example, I'm the president of Lloyd House, and there's also Page House, Venerable House, Avery House, Blacker House, which Adam was former president mm -hmm. of, Dabney, Fleming, and uh, Ricketts. So basically, just like what Vanessa was saying, rotation is kind of like the, house, the houses in Harry Potter in which students come, they get to see what the houses are like, and then are magically sorted via the algorithm into a house. And so rotation is this really fun week and a half in which what we call pre-frosh, but I think our now first year students come and they stay at just a random like residence for this week and a half. And during that time, each of the houses hosts specific events so that they can understand like, what house culture is like, uh, what kinds of events each house holds, like, what kinds of people are in each house. And during the course of this week and a half, they will go to different houses and go to their events, particularly go to dinners, which are a big thing here at Caltech. And then at the end of the week, you as a first year student will fill out um, just a ranking of the houses that you think that you fit into. And the houses also will come up with a list of pre-frosh or first year students that they think would be a good fit for their house. And then with these two lists, um, there's an algorithm that takes in all this information and then spits out uh, the house pairings for all the people who opted into rotation. And this can kind of sound like rushing a fraternity or sorority, but we really do want to emphasize that rotation is a fully an opt-in process. It's fun. The houses put a lot of effort into coming up with fun events for uh, first years to do. For example, in Lloyd House, we have a huge campus-wide game of capture the flag, and it's always this super competitive game and very fun, but as fun as that is, there's also a, like a group of people who will just stand to the side and watch people run around and try to capture the flag while drinking milkshakes, of course. Mm -hmm. So rotation is this really fun time that happens only once a year at the beginning. Um, and then after rotation is over and you get your house uh, pairing, then you finally move into your permanent residence, whether it's in the house or in unaffiliated housing. Um, but you're still like a member of Lloyd House, for example, even if you don't live inside of the house. Yeah, so like Harry Potter, um, every house kind of has its own set of traditions and a bit of a culture. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, they're all Caltech students. And I think it's a real testament um, to how great the school is um, that a lot of people end up getting memberships at two houses or, or they'll um, have a lot of friends in, in multiple houses. Um, personally, I can say that I, uh, so Caitlin talked about the ranking process, ended up getting my second choice house in terms of the ranking. Um, still ended up being president though, so <laughs> um, that worked out pretty well and I've had a lot of fun. Um, but so uh, Caitlin mentioned that Lloyd does capture the flag. This year we did a kind of a talent show um, in Blacker for our rotation event. Uh, that was, I got to cook with ingredients that people told me to use um, and it was a bit of a disaster, but it, it ended up working out okay. Um, and that kind of fun, spirited, traditional event goes throughout the year. Um, so every house has events that they run. We register them with uh, the offices of resident, residential experience. Um, and together we kind of work to ensure that we have events that are really kind of there to break um, all the studying and work that we're doing. Um, I know I would not be sane without my house events. Um, they really kind of carry uh, my social experience here. Um, the, the people in the house similarly are there for you as a first year. You're, uh, you're going to run into really hard classes, really hard homework. You're gonna be over your head probably for the first time in your life. 
um, and it's really the house that's there for you to kind of support you. Um, upperclassmen were there to give me advice on picking my next class. They were there for um, help on a problem set that they had to do a long time ago. Um, all that kind of stuff is, is just built into the house. Because uh, I think different from a lot of other colleges, you're living with people that have similar interests and that you know guaranteed. Um, you're not kind of randomly put into a room somewhere on campus. Um, so you're always going to know someone in the hall. You're always going to know someone around the corner. And I think that makes like a huge difference that it's really hard to kind of understand unless you live through it. Um, because just being able to open my door and scream out, is anyone taking this class next term? Um, and someone screaming back, no. <laughs> um, like that, that kind of experience is really special to hear. Um, and it's part of why I love living in the house. Um, I've also lived in Bechdel, uh, which is one of our unaffiliated housing options, uh, while being associated with a house. Um, and I think that every year we get a little better about kind of making that experience really great because you can experience um, kind of a house membership. You can have your space with people that have no house membership or are part of other houses and really kind of branch out and uh, meet more of the community. Yeah, I remember as a freshman, I was very uncertain about what Caltech was going to be like. My hometown is in New York City, so I was going across the country to this new place, Southern California, and let me tell you, the weather is <laughs> so perfect. But I came to this new place, and the school is like amazing and, and known for being academically rigorous, so it was very intimidating, um, me not really knowing anybody who had gone to Caltech to come here. But immediately after rotating into Lloyd House, you have this immediate center and support network of upperclassmen and also your fellow uh, first year students and second year students. And it's just so nice being able to walk around the house. For example, this is actually, this sweatshirt is actually a map of Lloyd House because um, like the alleys are arranged such that they're both in like L's. And basically something that Lloydies will often do is called a Lloyd lap in which you walk around and see like whose doors are open and then you can just kind of talk to them and try to get them to do something like go get boba or whatever. But yeah, being able to walk around the house and just walk up to upperclassmen and say things like, you're a dean's tutor for this core class, like can you help me out? Or find another group of first years and gather around like a whiteboard in the hallway and work on a physics problem to like 2 a.m. altogether because Collaboration is also something that's very important at Caltech, and I'm sure you've heard about this in other panels. And I guess when I first came here and heard about collaboration, I was a little bit skeptical, just because the school is so academically rigorous. But it really is the core part of the Caltech experience, being able to just go to people in your house or like in your classes and work together on problems. Um, and yeah, doing that inside of my house with with other Lloydies was a really important part for me. Thank you. Gavin? Hi. So I am a unaffiliated student, which means unlike some of the other students here, I don't belong to a particular house. Um, and the thing that I want to make really clear is that the housing system is really great, and a lot of people really love it, but it may not be for everybody, and that's OK. So for me, um, going into Caltech, the housing system didn't really appeal to me, and it wasn't something I was particularly interested in. Um, but here at ORE, they made it really simple um, and made it clear that rotation is opt-in. And if that's something that isn't um, something that you're really interested in, that's totally okay and there are other options for you. Um, so the Bechtel residence is uh, where I live. Um, it's the brand new building right down Moore Walk. And uh, I've lived here for uh, three years now and I've really loved it. So like I said, it's a brand new building um, and it's sweet style unlike the, uh, the houses. So what that means is you can live with groups of people, uh, four, six, eight, or 12 uh, of your friends, and you all share a common space uh, with a fridge, a little kitchenette, a common area, like a living room, um, and a big whiteboard wall. And um, everybody then has their own uh, bedrooms, which is really nice to give you a little bit of personal space while also having this place to collaborate and work with other people. Uh, so uh, during rotation, I was actually living in Bechtel in the current suite that I'm in. Um, and almost everybody there decided we loved living together, so we decided to stick together, and we're still living there to this day. Um, and it, it kind of creates a little family that you live with, you do things with. Um, you'll stay up, like the others were saying, you'll stay up in front of this whiteboard wall, sitting on the couch, silent for three hours, trying to solve a physics problem until somebody finally understands it, and you work together on it. Um, you go into town and you do things together. You cook together on the weekends. Um, it really is like a little family that you create, um, which is really, really nice. 
Um, and this is something that you can create for yourself every year. So if you decide that you want to be a part of a house, like everybody else in my suite is, uh, you can go live in that house for a year, or you can live in Bechtel. Um, and all of those experiences are really great and offer kind of a do-it-yourself way of creating a residential experience that works well for you. Um, so, like I said, Bechtel's really great. We have all sorts of amenities. We have a big courtyard. Uh, we have a, a, the dining halls built in. We have uh, ping pong tables and foosball tables. Um, so it, it's a lot of fun. And if you do want to participate in those house events, it's okay. You can still be a part of a house. Um, and you can live in Bechtel as well. So it's a really great experience. And for people who rotation may not be what you're interested in, or if you go through rotation and decide that the housing system isn't for you, that's totally okay. And there are lots of other options. So um, there's really unlimited options of what you can do with your residential experience here. And I would recommend looking at all of them. Thanks, Gavin. Rain? So I've been an RA now for five years. I was an RA one year in the North Houses, and I've been an RA in Bechtel for the past four years. RAs at Caltech were all full-time grad students. We don't have undergrad RAs, unlike many other institutions. And the number of RAs that you have in the house or residence, that's going to vary depending on the size. So some of the smaller houses will have one RA, some will have two. Bechtel is a huge building, so we have six RAs. We also have an RLC that lives um, inside the residence. We also have um, faculty in residence. So we have a faculty family, which is really nice. And RAs, they're integral parts of the support system here on campus. Um, you can kind of think of us as liaisons between the undergrad students and various resources on campus, such as the Counseling Center or the Title IX Office or Center for Diversity. Um, in my time as an RA, I've supported students through a variety of different issues. I've helped students struggling with academics. I've helped students struggling with their mental health. I've done some roommate conflict mediation. And just generally, if any student is struggling with something um, either academic-wise or with their personal life, like I'm here to provide support. Um, our interactions with students, they're both formal and informal. So students will see us around the residences, they'll see us in the hallways, they'll see us in the dining halls. If you're an RA for a house, you can have dinner with your students every night, which is really nice, and that's what I used to do when I was living in one of the North Houses. Um, we also do a lot of programming for students. So all of us as RAs will do both educational programming and also fun programming. So some of the educational programs I've done are resume review workshops, where I've had students just come hang out in the kitchen. I always bring food for students. Um, and I'll just review resumes, or have peers review resumes. I've done also a grad school application panel, because a lot of Caltech undergrads are interested in going into grad school. So um, either I'll work with myself or with another RA, and we'll just answer students' questions about the grad school application process. But we also do a lot of really fun events. Um, I brought a yoga instructor to do yoga in the Bechtel Courtyard. We have a really nice space, so I wanted to take advantage of that. I've done paint nights. Um, I've done make your own face mask events, uh, movie nights. And I generally like to survey all of my students in the beginning of the year to try to gauge what type of events they're interested in and make sure I tailor everything to my students' interests. The purpose of the events is to help um, foster a really strong sense of community within the building. It's a really nice way for us to get to know students, for students to get to know us, but also for students to get to know each other. So it's a great way to meet people outside of your suite or outside of your hall um, and meet people from different houses, for example, if the programming's happening in Bechtel. I also host weekly office hours, um, as do all of the RAs. So I'll usually just hang out in one of the kitchens in Bechtel. I'll bring tea and snacks, and students can just stop by and chat with, chat with me about whatever is kind of on their mind. Um, we provide support to all students from first years to seniors, but we like to make sure we provide you know, extra support to our first year students because we know the transition to college is very difficult, it's very overwhelming. So we do what's called midterm meetings. So these are meetings, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings between your RA and all of our first year students. So around week five or six of the term, you'll get an email from your RA to schedule a midterm meeting. And this is a really great chance for us to talk one-on-one -on -one and talk about you know, your academic progress, talk about uh, maybe internship search, how you're enjoying your time at Caltech or the house, and also to tackle any challenges or obstacles you might be facing. I also want to mention that um, all the RAs are here to support you. So even though you're going to have an assigned RA or like two RAs in your house or residence, really all of the RAs are at your disposal. So for example, I had an RA a couple months ago reach out to me um, saying that a student in their house was really interested in the biology PhD program, but he wasn't in biology, um, and asked if I could meet with that student, and I'm more than happy to do so. All of the RAs are really, really friendly um, and very approachable. 
We also undergo um, a lot of training. We have very extensive training in the summer, and we also do training weekly. We meet as a team to kind of tackle any issues that's occurring um, related to student life. So we're very well trained. But let's say, you know, there is an issue that we might not be necessarily equipped to handle. We can always, you know, connect you with another resource on campus or just um, kind of collaborate with um, someone else on campus to help solve, solve that issue. So as you've heard from a lot of the people on the panel already, at Caltech, no matter what house or residence you're in, you're gonna have a really strong support system. You know, that includes all of the RAs, all of the PAs, which Athena will talk about, health ads, RLCs, the faculty and residents, um, ORE, and there's a variety of other campus um, offices on campus to support, and everyone, you know, really wants you su to succeed here at Caltech. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm here to talk about the PA program. Um, so basically PAs act uh, in a similar way to RAs in some roles. Um, so basically we're trained uh, students that take a one-term course, um, which trains us to learn how to um, <clears throat> actively listen better, um, support students um, in a way that's really um, just welcoming and constructive. Um, so basically, um, the main role of PAs is to act as a liaison between students and um, other members of the Caltech community, like maybe they um, are having a mental health issue and would like to see counseling services, or maybe they have some career questions and you could point them in the direction of uh, relevant people, such as upperclassmen in the house or RAs um, or any other kinds of issues. Um, and so once we undergo this class, um, we learn about how to deal with mental health issues, um, with any kind of abuse, um, things like that, and um, so when students come to us, we're able to say, okay, like these are the things that, these are the options that are available to you, um, but also we're just here to talk. So if there's any kind of like very small issue to something really big, um, I think that a lot of students find it's easier to go talk to another student rather than directly approaching like someone who is um, um, like an official like uh, professional. Um, so basically, I think one of the ways that um, students find PAs the most available is during their office hours. So I have an office hour every week um, where I just keep my door open, um, just sit in my room, and if anyone ever wants to come and talk, they can always just walk in and find me and say, hey, like, you know, I'm having this really big issue, or, you know, I'm having a little argu w argument with my friend, and I wanted to talk it out with someone. Um, so, and then we also do, like, little fun things, like I have a candy bucket outside my door um, so people can walk by and just grab candy, um, stuff like that. And then we also do some programming. Um, we get a budget from um, ORE to put on some events, such as we uh, gave out some donuts last term and just chatted with students in the dining hall. Or um, I know that Lloyd does like a puzzle night. Um, and I think the really cool part about being a PA in a house specifically is I found that because like um, everyone knows each other within the first few weeks of school starting, it's really nice that um, like you're friends with most of these people. And so I found that it's really nice because they feel comfortable to come and talk to you like um, more often than not, um, which is cool. So I've had like most of my PAing experiences have been with people that I'm friends with. And so they really find it like com they, they find themselves comfortable to come and talk to us. Um, yeah, I think that covers most of it. Thank you. Dr. Crawford? I'll just borrow this for a second. <laughs> Hi. So I'm here to talk a little bit about student engagement and what you can expect from ORE as it relates to that. But before I do that, um, I had the luxury and pleasure of serving as a residential life coordinator here for over seven years. And so I can attest to every single resource that you just learned about um, because I was on that residential life team at one point. Um, and it is definitely a great system and setup that we have here. So I do hope um, that that's something that students will take advantage of if they come to Caltech. But student engagement, that's my current role. And to summarize, essentially I provide programming and engagement opportunities for undergraduates as well as graduate students on campus. So within the residences, outside of them, um, that's, that kind of encompasses what I do. But there are three things that I really want you to leave with um, as it relates to student engagement. The first thing is the first year experience. 
we know that the first year of college is a very, very difficult um, transition time for people. Um, and that's okay, it's supposed to be a little hard, um, but luckily first year students get to experience that together. They live together, they go to class together, they do work together, they have fun together, they have good times and not so good, good times together. Um, but in ORE, we strive to enhance that first year experience by providing dedicated programming and resources throughout the year. Um, so if your student comes, if you come, if your student comes here, you'll learn a little bit more about that. The second thing, faculty and alumni engagement. As my colleague mentioned, we do have a lovely faculty and residence program, um, as well as opportunities to get to know faculty outside the classroom. For example, our conversations with Caltech faculty series that we, we put on um, allow students to connect with faculty members, learn about their work, um, their paths, get advice, things of that nature. Just get to know them and build their network, expand their network. Um, and the same goes for alumni c connection and engagement. We try to bring back alumni, whether it's virtually or in person, um, to get to know students and, and help students build those connections as well. You never know um, when that might come in handy at some point throughout your career or your time at Caltech. And so those are the types of experiences related to faculty and alumni that we really like to have students involved in. And lastly, leadership and other involvement opportunities. It's, it's last on my list, but it's probably one of the most important in my opinion because involvement you know, leads to success. You know, we know that research shows that the more involved, the more likely you are to complete that degree. Um, and that's what we want ultimately. So we, if someone has an interest in leadership, we have student leaders as you just heard from. Um, but ORE offers support to them, whether it's through our Leadership Week training or ongoing support throughout the year, and just providing those opportunities for people to get involved. If they wanna join a club or create their own club, we can offer that and help with that as well. So for us, it's about getting involved in the ways that are comfortable for you and that are conducive to your success at Caltech. Um, we definitely support that. And we are also always open to hear how we can better support our students throughout the year. So thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists. Of course, you heard that we have so much going on. So let me kind of recap for a second and then let's have the chance to answer some questions. The first is that our goal is to connect students to each other. We know that that's really important when they arrive. We know that that's one of their biggest concerns about coming to college is will I make friends? Will I feel comfortable? Will I belong? And the answer is yes. And we're gonna work on that with them and make sure that that happens. So students being connected to each other. Students being connected to mentors. Leaders in the house, you met um, two of our house presidents, leaders and their residents, Gavin, or mentors that are graduate students that are important to their development, but not exactly staff members, right? That's a really delicate balance. So that's our second tier, is to make sure that there are people that they can talk to that are not their peers, but also are not necessarily us. Um, so it's a nice middle ground. And then of course we have our staff on campus and we have five professionals that live on campus, and then we have a whole office team um, in our building, and four faculty members who will be living on campus in the fall. So it's a really important safety net and system for supporting our community, and it's really important to us that it feels like a community. This transition for coming to college where you're detaching from your friends and your family and everything that's familiar and creating that here is not easy, but we're gonna be the most help we can and make this go really smoothly and successfully. So. With that said, let me talk to, let's all answer questions about what's on your mind. Um, and we'd love to be helpful. We'll take the questions and then we'll have our panelists weigh in on the things that um, you're interested in. Yes, thank you all so much. I have to say, I didn't even finish really like announcing Slido and we already had questions coming. Great, great. great. So uh, the first question is, do the houses fill up? If so, how are the decisions made and who can go to a house that is oversubscribed? Very good question. Um, the easy answer is yes, they fill up. They're very popular. People want to live in them. They are their own fun communities and families. Um, you can have a membership in more than one house, um, and you have the opportunity to live in your house over the course of four years. Let me talk to turn this over to our house presidents who can tell you a little bit about the examples of how their houses manage that. Sure. 
Um, yeah, so for example, I'm also a member of Fleming. So I have two house memberships, but I live in Blacker. Um, the PIX processes are kind of in flux. We're always kind of changing them. But the general idea is that there's some randomized like lottery number um, that decides kind of your order that you can pick into the house. And then there's usually some kind of incentive-based um, priority. Um, for example, the president should live in the house because they're the president of the house. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be kind of hard to run a house that you're not living from. Um, things like social directors, vice presidents, they tend to also um, get put in the house. Um, but after that, it's usually uh, we try to even out based on years, uh, usually giving a little bit of priority to seniors because of things like ditch day and whatnot. Um, and we go down the list, um, and when you get to the end and the house is full, the house is full. Um, but we've kind of worked, um, I've been doing student government for, for two years because before I was house president, I was uh, secretary of the inner house committee, and we've been working with ORE to kind of like make a more standard process where you can have a, a round for people who are not living in the house, the houses go, then you have a round for the people who didn't get into a house, um, but they still get to live on campus, and then kind of a catch-all to get everyone. Um, so I think we are at a pretty like comfortable place so that students don't have to stress about, oh, I'm gonna have to go you know, find rent in this really rich neighborhood. No, we don't do that. Um, you're always gonna get a spot on campus um, through some, some means. Students love living in the house. They also love living in Bechtel with their friends from the house or with other friends. So finding a place to live on campus is not hard. Um, finding your first choice to live for the, your first year or thereafter is, is a little trickier, but you will always have every opportunity. That's part of the experience here. So we make sure that, that you have the opportunities while you're here, even if it's not your sophomore year. But I think probably everybody here was able to live in the house that, that wanted to, yeah, definitely. The next popular question is about meals. So uh, what is the meal schedule? What does it look like if student feels hungry at late night? Is there an easy way to find something to eat? There's so much food on this campus. You cannot be hungry, although I find out at 4 in the morning that all the students are hungry, which is probably the only hour where there's not something open. Um, Athena, why don't we uh, start with you and work our way this direction about sure, food yeah. options and availability. Yeah, um, so I think there's, there's a good number of options on campus. Um, generally during the day, so we have Red Door and Chandler open for most of the day. Um, so you can get breakfast, lunch, dinner. Um, Broad is one of our cafes, which is my personal favorite on campus, um, is open for breakfast and lunch, and they have great sandwiches, soups, salads. Um, and I guess the my favorite feature of like the Caltech food um, scene is that Red Door, our cafe, is open until 2 a.m. every night. And so when you're done working on a set, or maybe you just need a break from your set and you're up like crazy late, um, you can always go and get like a quesadilla or like different things. Uh, we have like a late night menu, which is not available during the day, which includes like quesadillas, like hot dogs, stuff like that. So it's super great. It's a nice break. Um, and yeah, so if you're hungry really late at night, um, you have options even then. Yeah, and to kind of add on to that, um, you know, dinner is provided every night at the houses. Um, I think every house has their own dinner schedule of when it is, um, and the residences also have dinner available. Um, so for instance, for me, um, at 5.30, my entire suite, all eight of us will go down and get dinner together. Um, and the houses have a similar program where um, each of their, um, their dinners kind of is a tradition, has traditions um, involved with that, um, which the others can talk more about. Yeah, so before I get to that, there are open kitchen options in which you can just go find yourself some breakfast or dinner, and then you can go in and grab like yogurts or bagels and small, small food like that. But yeah, dinners are a really big part of house culture. For example, in Lloyd, one of our main objects is the gong. And at the end of every dinner, um, to end dinner, I will bang on the gong to signal that dinner is over. But yeah, we usually have lots of dinner games that happen during the weeks, um, mostly as ways to bring people together in the house. Um, there's also uh, waiters in the house that haven't been happening now due to COVID, but hopefully maybe later in this term and starting next year, we'll get them back, where basically there are students who are paid to uh, set the table, provide silverware and um, like house specific china and like plates and things and we'll bring out food from the open kitchen and food is served family style at the tables in the house. Um, and so yeah, that's a great way for students to make some money on campus and also to serve your house. 
It's one of the last campuses in America that does a formal family-style dinner every night for students. So talk about a community building opportunity. They all sit down. They invite me sometimes. Um, and it's wonderful. It's a great way to sit down and enjoy students. That said, if you ever want to find somebody on campus, you need to go to the Red Door at 155 and you'll find anybody that you need to talk to because they're all there getting food and quesadillas and stuff. So um, the, there is a lot of food. The, the food student, most students are on an anytime meal so that it's almost all you can eat all the time. Do first years literally move their clothes and things as they're checking out each house for a few days? I could speak to that. No. <laughs> <laughs> that would be insane. So basically, in this week and a half of rotation, you are assigned one room, and that's the room that you live out of for the week and a half. Uh, I think when I came as a first year, I didn't really unpack that much because I had maybe like one suitcase and one carry-on. Um, but yeah, during that week, in the daytime, you will go to different houses, you'll go to their, the house dinners, you'll go to their events, talk to people in the house after dinner, get a feeling for what house culture is like. And then at the end of the day, you'll go back to your one assigned house, uh, room in a house that's not necessarily the house you will rotate into. Um, and then after rotation results are out and you have your assigned house or residence, you will move and all the upperclassmen are available to help bring your stuff. And it's usually a really fun time in Lloyd as we like take shopping carts and various carts to bring um, suitcases over. So yes, that you do not have to move every single night to a different house, <laughs> you stay in one place. For students who do not want to go through this rotation process and have a, a move two weeks after they've arrived, there is an opportunity in the summer to just commit to Bechtel for the year because we know that's fun for some students, but not for all students. So there is an opportunity when you get the mailing this summer to say, I'd like to go straight to Bechtel and live there for the year, and I want to be part of this, but I want to go back to a permanent space. And we recognize that that's important for some students too, so we do have that available. How often do you go off campus? Ooh, uh, I will answer this one because it's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, a lot, if, well, it's, it's how much you want to, right? So personally, I like to go off campus a lot. Um, I have a tradition with my parents where I go on a walk in Pasadena and call them every weekend, mm -hmm. um, and it's really nice. I think Pasadena is cool because it's not like a, a super urban setting, um, but there is like a lot of stuff. So there's Lake Avenue, there's Hill, there's Colorado, um, and those are all within walking distance, and it's pretty common for students to get together to go um, for dinner on the weekends uh, on Lake. Um, it's also you know, college, like there's gonna be 2 a.m. Taco Bell. There is, like, a, there's all of that Taco Bell, McDonald's, they're all nearby. Um, and then LA is right there, it's only about 20 minutes drive. Um, I'll probably go to LA a lot less, um, but they have, you know, everything, because it's LA. Um, but it's, it's, it's great, because you can kind of modulate depending on how busy you are, so you'll have weeks where you're gonna like hole up in your room, but that's fine, because there's so much to do here. Um, and then there's some weeks where you have some more free time, and you and your friends can hop in a car and go to get K barbecue in Koreatown. Um, yeah, to add on to that, um, a lot of times when you're going off campus, um, if you're affiliated with the house, um, house events are super big. So for example, with Fleming, we, do, we did paintball last year. That was one of, one of my favorite experiences um, going off campus. And then we also do trips, um, ski trip, beach trip, um, camping trip. Um, so a lot of the times you can go off campus with your house um, and that's really fun too. Um, this next question is about, a little bit about safety. So uh, the question asks, any school provided transportation in campus? Is it safe to walk or bike to dorm in late night from library or class when shuttle is off? Well, we, we don't have a shuttle on campus, but we do have security who provides transportation and escort service around the community, um, the campus community. So we absolutely have that. That said, um, it's a pretty small campus and everything is really close. So uh, let me turn this over to the panel about how you navigate evening and security issues. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so um, personally, I don't typically go out that much at night. Um, but uh, when you do, um, like Felicia said, there's always security you can call. Um, but campus itself, it's really safe. It's really well lit, um, especially if you're going to go with another person. I've never once thought that I was going to be unsafe on campus or anything. Um, so, personally, if I needed to go somewhere late at night, I would feel 100% confident um, traveling alone on campus at night. Um, but especially if you bring friends, I, there's absolutely nothing to worry about on campus. 
Yeah, and the main library on campus, SFL, is maybe like a two minute walk <laughs> from my house. If I take my skateboard, it's like 45 seconds to get from door to door. So it's really not an issue, I think, of having to take a shuttle anywhere because our campus is pretty contained. Um, if you walk around campus, you'll see these blue light kind of stations. And those are places where if you do feel unsafe or if something has happened, you can press a button there and then security will come like within a minute or something. Um, and so that's really nice because those are really scattered around everywhere on campus. And so for all of our guests, we're actually going to do kind of the farthest walk, if you will, for our next session when we go to dinner. So we'll be heading over to the southern part of campus pretty soon. The next question is, can you give us an idea of the personalities of the different houses? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have rotation rules um, in play now and until rotation ends in the fall. Um, so we want everyone to have an unbiased kind of personal experience with rotation. So we want you to go experience the houses in rotation mm -hmm. and make your own kind of um, draw takeaways about what the houses are. Um, because I guarantee you, if I talk to you about the houses, you could probably guess which one I would say is the most fun. Um, <laughs> They're all wonderful, and there's a strong ethic about ensuring that everybody has equal access and opportunity to meet the houses and get to know them for themselves. So that's why everybody's saying, no, we don't talk about their personalities because first of all, they all have wonderful ones, and second of all, that's up to you to find the house that, that you like. So um, any other questions? Yeah, we have time for one more question. And so this question is, I heard that students in each house eat dinner together. Who prepares the dinners? No dining halls open for dinners then? Uh, to speak to that, uh, there are dining halls open for dinner. You can go to Brown Cafe, which is open for dinner, and that's kind of like a main place for people to go and get food. There's like really good like pizza there, and you can get the special of the day. But uh, every night, yes, in within the houses, there are you know dinners. And well, for example, Lloyd House has dinner at 6.25 every night. Um, and then we'll all eat together. People can bring in food from other places. The food that's provided in the house is made by Caltech Dining Services. And that food is um, provided by like the North House Kitchen. Um, and yeah, you can just go into Open Kitchen and get your food and then come out and then eat with everybody. It's the, the same food. They drive it over from Brown to the houses to serve, so it's not like you're missing out on like the special <laughs> meal or whatever. Actually, Brown, which is the more accessible one, has the special meals, um, and that's open for longer and is not like a big family-style thing. That's like cafe. You go and you go out. Well, thank you all. Let me say congratulations. Um, it's such a compliment to the students who have chosen to apply and consider coming here. We're so grateful. Um, a special congratulations to parents. Great work. We're so happy that your student is interested. And I'm taking parenting tips after the session for those of you that, um, you know, that's amazing to have a, a, a son or daughter that was able to come here. And we're really, we're really grateful to you for being part of our session. If we can answer any questions, feel free to come up. We'll stay for a few minutes if that's okay. Yes. And if you would please join me in thanking our panelists and helping us understand more about life and learning as a tacker. So they will be kind enough to stick around for a little bit. Uh, so if you do have a question, you are more than welcome to ask them questions. We will be transitioning now over to dinner. My colleague Melissa here behind me and my colleague Jan is also around and they'll be guiding you down to the South Athletic Fields for dinner.